All right, well, welcome everybody. I'm sensitive to the fact that we have several people here. Uh, a welcome to our building leadership. It's 7.03. I'm sure that you all would like to tell us what you want to tell us and then get off to a, a restful evening. So let's kick it off. Uh, Mr. Kimball, would you call the roll, please? Oh, absolutely. Let's see. Uh, Mr. Castillo. Here. Uh, Ms. Gill. Here. Mr. Lawrence. Here. Uh, Ms. Ward. Here. Okay. All right, would you all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Next we come to adoption of the agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Gill. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? All right, so we have an agenda now. And first on our agenda tonight is report about student achievement with the building leadership. Dr. Jones and Where I'm company. Kika Talisa. She's going to right. start us out. Yep. Good evening. Um, I'm happy tonight to have with me our leadership team, our wonderful and illustrious principals who will be sharing with you um, the state of their schools in, in terms of the academic achievement um, and growth that we've made this year. Um, each one of them will share with you about their building and, and highlight even strategic things that they are planning for the year. Um, I will kick us off. Um, but we need to go a couple more slides. And we'll start first start looking at our historic enrollment data. And I know you receive this data um, on a weekly or monthly basis. But just wanted to highlight our growth since 2013 to now. We, um, you know, it's, it's historic growth for, for Falls Church. Now, as we move into um, Falls Church and looking at SOLs, which is one measure that we use for our students and, and their achievement, Falls Church City Public School is fully accredited. Um, with full accreditation, students must achieve adjusted pass rates of at least 75% in English reading, <coughs> writing SOLs, 70% in mathematics, science, history, and SOLs, and then also as a high school must meet the benchmark for graduation um, at an 85%. Um, graduation rate and so we will Jeannie's going to share now um, components of where we are um, compared to the state so I'm going to do the division wide data and then we'll break it down by school as we go around the room um, with the different principles for each building so when we're looking at our SOL pass rate for the division in reading writing math science and history you can see that we are staying fairly consistent from one year to the next over a three-year period. We had um, did have a slight dip there in math. Um, there's a few different factors we're looking at for that. We had the new um, computer adaptive test um, was administered last year, and we're thinking that that might have some influence on that score. So we are looking at that and, and seeing where we can make some adjustments. For our comparison with the state to see where the state is and where we are, we're looking again at the reading, writing, math, science, and history, and the state is in the blue, and SECPS, you see, is in the red, and we are above the state average in all of those areas. For our subgroup in reading, we have here all students, and then we're looking at our subgroups the way the um, state identifies our subgroups as aging, economically disadvantaged, LEP, which are our ESOL students, and then students with disabilities and white. And we're going to be looking at our, our subgroup population. You can see that there are some areas where there's some significant growth. Uh, we're looking at our LEP in reading. Over the last few years, we've been working very hard, teachers, administrators, everybody that possibly can to make sure that this subgroup particularly is showing growth. And if you're looking from a 46% pass rate to a 54 or 65, that's pretty significant growth for that subgroup. Usually it's only a few percentage points a year. So you can see that the work is being done at all the school levels is, is really paying off. Jeannie, these subgroups are 
state subgroups that we have to report yes. because they're okay they're just kind of odd for us and then just an, another question this is <coughs> year f over year but it's a we've had a discussion over how each cohort does year over year versus you know sixth graders versus sixth graders versus sixth graders from year to year is there any does does that look any different if you break it out in that fashion We'll we'll look at okay. some of that when right. we get into okay. it a little bit later. Okay. You're just getting excited. <laughs> and this is since this is division wide, this, these are all of our students that take an SOL from grades three all the way up to um, you know their end of course. So these are students that have been with us for years, or students that may be new to us, you know, just in the last last year or so. And then again, comparing the state with. Falls Church, uh, as you can see, we are above the state average in all of the subgroup areas except for one. Our economically disadvantaged, um, we were okay last year, and we, we did dip a little bit in that area. And you can see too, one thing that stands out is the students with disabilities. I know Liz Grimm will probably speak to that a little bit more, but we are very. Um, far ahead in the state with this subgroup population, one of the highest. And then again, looking at math the same way, uh, again, staying fairly consistent across the subgroups. Uh, we do have a, a few dips, um, but we also have some, some of those increases in there. Uh, we are looking at this. There are some things that are happening in the buildings to address uh, some of our, our math uh, guided math, for example, uh, at the elementary level, and we're cross-walking some of the curriculum and the standards a little bit from the state. And then again, our subgroup population with our math. And again, students with disabilities are, are still ranking fairly high, um, pretty consistent with their economic disadvantage to, from last year. Okay, and then a second measure that we use for screening in the beginning of the year, and we give the star reading and math assessments four times throughout the year as a progress monitoring tool. And Justin, this is one of the ways that you can see how growth happens for some of our students. For example, when you look at third grade, <coughs> you see the red circles. It shows that when they were third graders in 13, it was 4.5. Um, and as fourth graders, they were a 7.0 by the end of the school year and 8.3 by the end of their fifth grade year. So that's a way that we follow the cohorts just to see um, how they're making, making progress. And you'll see that in all of the grade levels, they are making um, their, first of all, above the grade level because this is grade level equivalency on the star. So all of them are pretty much above where you would expect a student at that grade level to be, but they're, they're two or three grade levels in terms of reading, but we continue to make growth in terms of STAR and progress monitoring. And we look, use the STAR reading for our RTI process to intervene on students and to find out which students we need to, to work with um, to make sure that they continue to make the growth. And you'll see it stops with eighth grade and ninth through twelfth grade. We target specific students, whether it's you know students who you know are identified through the RTI process <coughs> as needing some additional um, service. And then here's our the same for our star math annual growth. Um, again, you'll see the cohorts of students: 2.9, 6.0, 7.0 um, <coughs> in terms of second graders. And again, it's still in nine through twelve. It's targeted students only. But there's growth every year. There's growth every year, Even yes. from cohorts and grade levels. That's it's, correct. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. And I mean, that's one of the reasons that we like STAR is because it can, we give it four times a year, but a teacher at any point can give a STAR assessment to determine if there's an area that um, the student may be needing some additional skills in. And, and the, the STAR breaks it down to show you exactly what skills um, the, the student may have been struggling on. So we can use it to really even develop some plans if we, we choose to use it that way. All right, Mr. Hills, you're up. All right, thank you. Let's go ahead and get things kicked off. Uh, here's taking a look at our enrollment data, uh, very much on par with what Ms. Hyde discussed. You can see the enrollment and how it's grown. Uh, this year, as of September 9th, we're at about 821. 
It's the highest we've been at since I've been there. Uh, we're definitely feeling it. Class sizes are uh, a little bit higher than they've been in years past. Is what's the, what's the uh, building capacity? It's a great. 750. 750. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Jones. <laughs> yes. And then I think another thing worth pointing out is, so you're you're up, uh, you know, 30 odd students. But mm -hmm. how many are completely new to the division? That that's that's a great point. Um, last I checked, we had 116 new students, uh, and that's in grades nine through 12. Uh, even this year, we're close to about 15 new 12th graders. Uh, so that's you know normally we average anywhere from about 80 to 100. So we're we're definitely up in that category as well this year. Okay, uh, taking a look at our graduation rate uh, compared to some of the schools in the surrounding areas, as you can see, 100%. And that really speaks volume to our teachers, their ability to really differentiate, um, but also the alternative programs that we offer. Um, this is something that does not come uh, by chance. It's something that we work very hard at. Our teachers are creative. Uh, our hybrid learning program. Um, the ability to really focus on students on an individual basis is something that allows us to achieve this, this goal. And so it's uh, very proud of our, our teachers and our students. Uh, taking a look at our, our IB, AP, and dual enrollment uh, numbers, you can see that these are the numbers of students enrolled by each grade. Uh, the, the, the ninth grade numbers are low mainly because we don't have students enrolled in AP courses until their 10th grade year and then our IB classes, many of them are not enrolled until their 11th and 12th grade years. Uh, but as you can see, those numbers continue to rise. And then if you take a look at the next slide, one of the things I point out here is the 76% of our students in grades 10 through 12 were enrolled in at least one AP, DB, uh, DE, or IB course. That's, that's pretty tremendous when you take a look at the numbers. And then if you break it down even further, we have 83% of our students in grades 11 and 12, which predominantly is where you're going to find your AP and IB classes as well as do enrollment classes. They're enrolled in at least one course. That's 83% of our entire student body. That's, that's incredible. Just to even break it down a little bit further, uh, one of the things, uh, a number that stuck out to me, 162 out of 178 of our seniors were enrolled in at least one AP, one dual enrollment or IB course last year. And that's, uh, that speaks volume to our open enrollment policy, uh, the ability of our teachers to really work with all students, uh, the, the ability to them to address different learning levels and styles. and. Um, we also said that 130 out of 178 were enrolled in three or more AP dual enrollment or IB courses. So when you think about the idea of students challenging themselves, rigor in the classroom, uh, this is exactly what our students are doing. This is a snapshot of uh, our dual enrollment numbers. Uh, we really kind of focused last year on giving an opportunity for our students to take several courses. We currently offer five dual enrollment classes for this year. Uh, as you can see the numbers, we have 180 students enrolled. Uh, we have a total of seven sections, including a summer section that we have, that we had uh, 12 students take this year. So the numbers are continuing, uh, continue to increase. And then when you take a look at, I want to point out our summer academy enrollment, we talked often about how this is really a year-round school. And we have students who will start many of our classes in June. Uh, they'll finish at the end of the summer. It's not just our students that are in need of remediation. Those numbers are quite low. These are students that really want to accelerate their academic path. And what it's allowing them to do is open spaces in their schedule to take additional elective classes. Um, we have seniors that are now able to complete the IB diploma. Uh, they're not being inundated with having to take a full load, which allows them to kind of uh, focus on other areas. And that's kind of what we're focusing on in, at George Mason excelling in mind, body, and character, and creating well-rounded students. And this speaks to what we're able to do. And I thought we broke it down perfectly by saying two out of three students in grades 10 through 12, so that's rising 10 through 12 graders, participate in our Summer Learning Academy. And here is some of our uh, SOL reading scores. As you can see, compared to other schools in the area, we do very well. Uh, numbers continue to grow. Also, our SOL numbers uh, in, in math. Uh, one of the things we tried to focus on this year with our, our math scores, uh, we 
established a, a math SOL day. We have about 450 of our students enrolled in an SOL math course. We know that uh, our math SOLs are those that take significantly longer, and so we wanted to create an environment where students did not feel rushed. They did not feel as though they needed to stress out. Um, we noticed that several in several of our um, Algebra 1 as well as Algebra 2 classes, the numbers did increase, and so hopefully we will continue to do that as we move forward. Taking a look at our strategic initiatives, uh, <coughs> as you saw, we want to continue to offer rigorous courses that meet the needs of all learners, and that will continue uh, with our open enrollment policy. Students are able to take all courses, and it's really we, we've seen a significant uh, change in the students who will want to take some of these classes, and it's it's incredible to see. And really, we want to continue to provide support to staff so that you know the culture of collaboration can be sustained, um, and I think. Our overall goal ultimately is we want to continue emphasis on personalized learning. Uh, it's an initiative that we believe strongly in, making sure that students are able to create um, and not just, uh, they're not just dictated what they need to do. And obviously excelling in mind, body, and character, we're going to continue with that message. That's something we're, we're sending through, through our students throughout the year. Uh, actually this Thursday we're doing a day called Character Day where students are going to be learning about um, different components of, of character character that they can uh, kind of believe in and, and use as, as being a Mustang. So that's kind of what we plan on doing this year. Mr. Harris. Sir. All right. Good evening, everyone. Go through uh, all of our data is going to mirror what you just saw with GM um, as far as our enrollment data. We are currently at um, 591. At one point, we were actually over 600. We were at, I think, a high of 607 um, at one point. And we are, I, I, I don't know what our capacity is. 600. Um, but I know we're close. I know we're close. I know that we've converted every single space that we had available to a classroom. So there, there are no empty rooms at MEH. Um, so let's start, uh, as far as data, with our ESOL data. Um, this has been an area that we have really tried to shore up um, you know f from two years ago to last year uh, we did see that there were you know some gaps and and so we really made it a focus to um, of ours to improve and, and we feel that um, you know our staff has done an amazing job in ensuring that we did see that growth and so when you look at this chart if you look at the top one uh, which is the composite start versus the composite finish it's it's important to notice um, from level one to level two, level three, level four, level five, you'll notice that the two bars uh, get closer and closer together as you reach level five, and that's what you want. Um, you're supposed to see the largest growth uh, in those early, the, the level ones and level twos. Um, as you get to towards the end, that's when you exit out of um, service. And so um, seeing those, those numbers, those figures for levels one, two, and three, that's really important. That means we're doing what we're supposed to do. Um, and then again, kind of the same thing with the literacy scores down at the bottom. Um, once again, you're noticing the growth overall, but um, you know, level one, level two is where you're going to see the most, the most growth. Um, five of the, of the seven level five ESOL students that we had uh, moved to the exit status, which is which is our goal. Okay, for reading, um, this is just the trend over time, the three-year. Um, Kind of model, and we've compared this to the state. So, um, the first two columns there are the reading six SOL versus the Virginia state scores for reading six. As you can see, um, you know, we, we are at least 10 points higher across the board, and some in some cases almost 20 points higher than than the state average um, for um, the reading SOL. And this is a comparison uh, with area schools, Swanson Middle School in Arlington, Williamsburg Middle School also in Arlington. This is the SOL pass rate for reading uh, for this, this past year. As you can see, we are on par with uh, the, our neighboring schools. And this is a math one. This is a little harder to see as we have um, a lot of, of math SOLs that are administered. Um, but you will still notice if you compare the MEH score um, with the Virginia um, state score, we, we are higher than the state average 
um, you know, with algebra and geometry, um, you know, we, we can't get any higher, but um, in the other areas, we are <laughs> continuing to, um, to improve. And a comparison here. Do you mind actually just mentioning, just for some of the board members, that it's been a year, how we are structured for your middle school math to not just focus. Uh, right, that I was going to talk about that right here. Okay, okay. Uh, so you'll notice here, uh, these are the SOL, um, you know, math scores um, average across. And you, you see us at 89, where I say Williamsburg is 95. And it's important uh, to note, um, math is the, the one subject at MEH where we really have, st we, we, we push students to, to challenge themselves. And so um, we have some sixth graders taking, say, math eight. We have eighth graders taking algebra geometry. Um, and to, to give you specifics, so with our eighth grade class currently, we have 10 sections of math that we offer. Four of them are algebra, two of them are geometry, and then the other four are math eight. What that means is over half of our eighth grade students are taking above grade math. So they're not gonna show on the great when you see math eight data what you're seeing is the four section or the equivalent of the four sections they're taking it not those those algebra kids that had they taken the math eight exam those scores would be astronomical um well over you know 94 95. i don't know if that makes sense to everyone but that's that's kind of of why we're always seeming like we're we're not showing um, much growth there but that's what that means we're actually doing a really good job um, across the board in our math classes as well as our reading. And then just the other subjects, uh, civics, and this is compared to the state. As you can see, um, you know, once again, about 10 points higher than, than uh, where the state is um, in all three of these SOL scores. And our strategic initiatives, um, you know, our focus in our building is, is building the social emotional supports and expanding service learning. Um, implementing new PBI strategies to spotlight praiseworthy actions by students and staff. If you've been to the building within the past week, you'll probably notice uh, an addition uh, right beside the Securitas desk. We have a, a huge um, sign where we're going to put pictures of Huskies of the Month. So we have two students for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, as well as two staff members. And so they're, they're eight by ten. We'll go up on, on that board uh, for a month. And teachers select the students. Uh, and then teachers select each other for the staff spots. Um, so that's new this year. Is positive behavior. behavior, intervention, and supports. Um, increased capacity of students to lead and advocate for themselves. Uh, tomorrow we're actually going to Robinson High School to participate in a character education program um, through Jostens, which is our yearbook and our ring distributor. Uh, it's a program called The Harbor, if you want to Google it. Uh, very impactful. Uh, geared towards middle and high school students, and um, you know it's it's like a character ed, anti-bullying, um, positive school climate, all of the above um, type, you know, program. And so we're excited to do that. We're taking 40 students and eight staff members uh, tomorrow. Uh, we want to continue to increase communication and stakeholder engagement. Um, we scheduled a number of uh, family engagement type activities. Uh, we're building on our STEAM nights that we did last year, our family STEAM nights. Um, we also have other things going on um, on October 14th. We're actually going to have a faculty basketball game. Um, so we encourage you all to come out and, and, and join us with that. But we just want to do more things to get, get the community into the building and, and um, you know, working with us. And then the final piece is improve GAP Group 1 performance SOLs. GAP Group 1 are your disadvantaged, um, your, e your ESOL students and your um, students with disabilities. And so... Um, that that's always going to be a, a focus, and, and we take that you know very seriously. Thank you, Bruce. Any questions, Ms. Harris? Okay. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, as a a new resident of Virginia, there are some things that I'm still not used to. Washington D.C. traffic is one, <laughs> and I am still in the majesty of living in this area's history. And as I looked over our presentation at Thomas Jefferson, I was taken by the fact that any one of us could leave this room. We could go to a memorial on the National Mall where an American president reminded us something along the lines of that the test of our progress is not whether we can add abundance to those who have much, but whether we can contribute enough to those who have too little. 
And I think that what you're going to see from TJ is very similar to that in the slide that you have seen already, and I suspect you will see two more times. Our enrollment <laughs> is um, is growing exponentially. Uh, we were talking about a 15 percent or so increase over the last three years. Um, I too do not know what our building capacity is, but if we're not there, we're close. Um, bathrooms are not yet instructional spaces <laughs> for us. I think there's a lot of good news. If you look at, at our overall macro here, you see that both in language arts and math, we're significantly outperforming state averages over the last three years. We also see trending increases over the last three years, both in language arts and math. It's not on this chart, but if you were to take a look at our, our data, interestingly, you would see that kids with disabilities at TJ are significantly outperforming state average. That's a hard, hard thing to do, and that's something that we should be very proud of. Now, we also have to take into account, though, roughly the 10 percent or so of our kids that fit into one or both of these areas. And I think when you look at our ESOL kids, for instance, the top, the top chart there, I think we have to recognize that not only are we looking at kids that are really struggling, but if we're going to be very candid, we are looking at kids that are performing below the state level. That's something that, that we are very cognizant of. There is, and I say this not to gloss this over, but I do think that there is some silver lining. If you look particularly at the top slide in the first three columns, those are language arch scores. And what you see is that there is a significant narrowing of the gap between our performance and state average. I think that is a sign of hope. Uh, it is not a sign that our work is complete. But I think it does suggest that some of the initiatives that the district has worked on, particularly guided reading, I think has, I think those investments have paid off for us. Like many schools across the country, you look at our economically disadvantaged kids and we, we struggle. We do. We see um, kids that there is plenty of room for us to move. In some regards, I think the real star of this show is Spring Hill. Jamestown may be a little bit of an outlier because Jamestown does not have enough kids to constitute either a ESOL group relative to SOL performance. They also don't have enough kids to form economically disadvantaged kids. Spring Hill, however, does. This last year, Spring Hill for ESOL kids in language arts performance checked in to the tune of a 94% pass rate. That's, that's incredibly impressive. Um, so you can rest assured we are going to be in touch with Spring Hill to find out what's going on there. We've got some ideas. Uh, and, and I'll speak to what I think may explain the softness of some of our numbers there. And I think same thing when you look at, at math. I think those findings are duplicated. So where do we go from here? I think the data clearly suggests that we need to prioritize those ESOL kids. That is, again, these are roughly 63 active ESOL kids at TJ, another 20 that have been exited, but we're still monitoring. Put together, that's about 10 percent of our school population that we need to minister to. And we've got some very concrete ideas on this. I had a meeting just this morning where we had talked about this. I've got another meeting scheduled in the next couple of days about how we can maybe divert some resources and bolster some things there. Um, Lisa and Jeannie can speak to this much more knowledgeably than I can, but my understanding is that the VGLA assessment, which is an assessment targeted for ESOL kids, has not been widely used at TJ in recent years. And there's some implications to that. I think certainly when you look at our overall performance, I think that is one area where we can boost numbers. In my view, much more important than just the quantitative aspects of this, I think we just even have an ethical duty to make sure that we've got kids taking the appropriate assessment for them. It, it's just not rational and it's just not fair to ask a really, really, really struggling learner to sit down in front of an SOL that we know they are really going to struggle on. Paul, can I just say one thing? Please. And the VGLA stands for Virginia Grade Level Assessment. And what it allows students, it's, a, it's like a portfolio. It allows them to 
master skills um, that are on their the SOLs that are at their level, but they can use materials that are at their level to be able to master those skills. So it's really not where they sit down and do multiple choice. It's work samples throughout the school year that can be, and then we turn it into the state and it's evaluated. So it, it definitely benefits our students. Thank you. But, but that doesn't take the place of the SOL. It does take the place of the SOL for our English as a second language population. Okay, and what do you need to do to be able to do that? Is is there are there steps to say? You know, these you have kids to help me with the, the numbers. So <laughs> the students have to oh, so been in Virginia. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll let you say it. The reader level has to be depending on what grade they are in, either a three point four or three point five right. reader level to qualify. Anything that or below, they can qualify for the assessment. Anything higher than that, they aren't allowed to take it. They have to take the actual as well. Thank and you. we'll be looking at WIDA levels a little bit later. And so they're they're completely peeled off of the SOL track. They don't. Peer they won't take it for any... that particular year. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it'll count as if it's an SOL for them. That will be their SOL. So they would count in our our pass rate. So it would be folded into that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it still counts. It's yeah. just they get okay. to take a more appropriate. Right. Okay. And to put this in perspective, we've got 63 active ESOL kids at TJ right now, and obviously some of those are second graders. But among those kids, if we can do this, if we just have six, six more, that's it, six that pass VGLA, all of a sudden we are higher than state average with just six. And that's, that's something that we absolutely are going to turn our attention to. And obviously we'll continue to do some of the, the district um, led things like guided reading and guided math. I think we're, we're seeing massive dividends in, in both of those things. And then finally, as, as a first year principal, I'm certainly familiar with the climate survey that was administered in spring and at TJ. We have to acknowledge that. And we already are. We are acting on that. Um, I think it's, in fairness, it will take more than a year to get to where we need to get. But I love our chances to make some massive progress. Just one more, sorry, VGLA question. Since it's a year-long thing, when would kids have to be identified? Is it, I mean, is it too late this year? Basically, no, we, we can identify them at the beginning of the year, and then it's throughout the school year that we collect the data, and then we submit okay. it in the spring. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. And I, we I know who to. those kids are, because we, we know their WIDA levels, so we know who they are right now. Right, okay, no, I just want to make sure there wasn't some dumb idea that made us lose an entire year. No. So, okay, good. Oh, Ms. Gill. I just have a, a, just a quick question. Um, how much do our ESOL and um, economically disadvantaged populations overlap? Uh, so, significantly. Okay. I just want to, yeah, so if we're doing the VGLA, that will help, hopefully help both. You're getting two for one. Okay. Great. Many of them. Well, not all. Are there triple identifications? Yes. There are. Yeah. Sometimes there are. Hi. Well, I'm here to talk about math. <laughs> Um, so we have our enrollment data as well, and last year was an interesting year. Our enrollment actually dipped a little bit, which let us all fit a little better into the building and gave us a little bit of a break while we were waiting to hear from Fairfax County. And then as of this year, we are back up to where we were the previous two years. Um, we do have less teachers this year still which I'm sure all of you know, um, but that has been something that has fluctuated as well. So both of those numbers are in that top slide there. And then I've also broken it down by our subgroup enrollment because especially with having kindergarten at Mount Daniel, um, we get the new kids every year. So that's the start of our subgroups if these children are going to stay with us through their careers um, in FCCPS. So our ESOL population has remained pretty consistent. Our special ed population, though, is changing a lot. Um, I think that the preschool having a larger program has helped us tremendously in providing some structure for kids. They're not being over-identified coming to us. Um, so this year our number is lower, but we're seeing kids that have a lot more severe needs. Um, so they're taking up a lot more teacher time and they are a lot further below grade level coming in than some of the students in the past. Mr. Lawrence, did you have Yeah, a question? one question, if you could just go back. Mm -hmm. You mentioned fewer teachers. Is that why at 382, we still only have 17 classrooms as opposed to when we had 380, we had 18 or more? Because yes. it, it seems we had 17 at 346 and we still have 17 at 382. Right. But that just means 
the classes are bigger. Yes, the kindergarten classes in particular have 24 students in them this year. Right. Thank you. Um, so the DRA is the main assessment that we use to assess students' reading levels. It's the developmental reading assessment. Um, it's administered one-on-one -on -one with the classroom teacher listening to the student read a story that they've never read before and then asking the student to retell that story in order. Um, it measures what the student is able to do completely independently. So it's very different than the instruction that they get in a guided reading group where the teacher can be prompting and giving them some hints and things. On this assessment, the child reads, the teacher writes what they can read, and then the child just speaks. Um, so these charts represent the percentage of students who met our spring DRA benchmark, and it's over a three-year trend. So <coughs> the first column in each graph is all students, so that includes the ESOL populations and the special education populations. Um, and then the second bar is our ESOL population, which we saw a very large dip in our ESOL population especially in kindergarten last year. Those kids coming into us um, had a lot higher level of need, but that is increasing, so that's good. Um, and then the special education population, especially in kindergarten with that 10%, last year that speaks to the actual population. We had a lot fewer kids, mm -hmm. and several of those kids were not even able to access the DRA, so the, the couple that took it met grade level, but the others did not even complete that assessment. So that explains that number being a bit lower in kindergarten especially. Um, and then in first grade, um, our all students, ESOL and SPED, we have seen an upward trend again from last year to this year in our ESOL population, which the ESOL staff and Jeannie and Lisa worked very hard last year to implement a new intervention for those students and we, we liked the results that we saw with them so far. Another assessment that we give is PALS, which is the Phonological Awareness and Literacy Screening. So it is an assessment that starts off as a whole group screening, and then if a student does not perform well in a whole group setting, it can be given individually as well. And it measures the student's phonological awareness skills. So those are kind of the pieces that all of the students put together to then be able to read. So this measures do they have all the mechanics and then the DRA measures can they actually do it so the DRA is measuring can they put it all together and do it on their own and this measures whether or not they understand the letters and sounds and how to blend words together and segment words to complete the process of reading so our PALS results are actually very good especially in kindergarten um, our ESOL population did very well um, two years ago and we saw a dip this past year but we saw an increase in their DRA scores. So that told us that the intervention that we're using perhaps doesn't focus as much on these isolated skills, but more on putting the pieces together. So that's something we're gonna look at this year. Um, and if you look at our special education students, especially in kindergarten, that group that only had a 10% on the DRA has a 90% pass rate on PALS. So those kids have all the pieces, they just haven't quite put it together yet. So we're hoping to see that population this year perform better on the DRA. Um, in kindergarten, it's given three times, so it's a pretty frequent assessment. In first grade, it's only given at the end of the year. Um, and with our numbers looking how they do with first grade in both ESOL and special education, um, we're looking at different interventions to provide these kids um, to work on these skills. One of our teachers has become trained in um, Orton-Gillingham, which is a phonological intervention. So we're looking at really trying to help some of those kids build these pieces to help them to be able to read. We also give STAR. In kindergarten, we give what's called STAR Early Literacy, and so that's the top graph, and you can see that's the average performance of all of the kids that take STAR. Every student takes it, so it does have <coughs> an upward trend. And STAR Early Literacy doesn't measure things in percentiles, but to give you an idea, that 743 that was the average score at the end of the year is the 75th percentile for all students taking STAR early literacy. So compared to students across the nation taking it, our, our average score was, was very good. Um, our STAR math is a first grade assessment that's given four times a year. And so at the beginning of the year, middle of the year, and then end of the year, those are the students' scores in STAR math. Um, 
I loved seeing the growth from beginning to middle. Not quite sure happened what, what happened at the end there in math, but we are happy that they're um, above average. And then our star reading for first grade also had an upward trend. So what do we do when students aren't being successful? Um, RTI is a big piece of what we do at Mount Daniel. So it's a tiered system of supports for students who are not performing on grade level. So the purple line on both of these is what we would consider the on grade level line. So if you look at our kindergartners, <coughs> in fact, all of the students began above what would be considered the grade level marked by PALS. Um, and then whenever interventions were provided, they continued to stay above that line. So tier two is a classroom teacher giving just some kind of additional instruction. Tier three, we actually call it two slash three, is the classroom teacher <coughs> giving some instruction and a specialist giving some kind of instruction, a reading <coughs> specialist or a math specialist, a couple of days a week. And then tier three would be a student meeting with a specialist four or five days a week in an intensive intervention like reading recovery or something like LLI and ESOL. So there's even different levels with our specialists of what students get. So the goal is to have all of those different lines increase at a higher rate than what on grade level would be considered um, and to maintain above what on grade level would be considered to close that gap. So for kindergarten, if you look at our tier two and tier three interventions, they did a great job where I think we need to hone in a little bit as those tier two and three kids that are getting something from the classroom and something from a specialist. We've talked about making those align better um, so that the classroom teacher and the specialist are doing the same thing. So it's not the kid is getting two completely different lessons, just extra ones, but they're getting the same lesson in multiple methods. Um, and same with the DRA scores. Um, we had a lot of growth with our tier three students. Reading recovery is a huge part of that that they are closing that gap up to on grade level. And then our tier two students that were just getting in classroom intervention actually did surpass that on grade level marker. So that was great intervention by the classroom teacher with those students. And that would be an addition to a student's guided reading group that's already individualized for them. Summer school, um, we used STAR as our assessment in summer school. 50% of students that attended summer school improved their star math, star math score. 50% of students improved their early literacy score, which is the kindergarten group. But then the score we were really happy about is 85% of students improved their star reading score. So that's the first grade students. And we tried a new intervention with the first grade group that got some really great results. We were able to get an additional ESOL teacher that was able to intervene and we did something called the RICU, the Reading Intensive Care Unit. We went and visited a pilot school in Fairfax that uses it, and we thought, well, what better way to pilot it than in summer school? And it had great results for those kids. So we're definitely gonna use it next year for summer school, hopefully with everyone, and we're looking at our schedule right now to see how to implement it as an intervention during the school year for second semester. And then our initiatives, we are going to continue to improve our PYP program of inquiry based on the results of our evaluation visit last year. We had some great recommendations that we are ready to get to work on from that. Um, <coughs> we're going to begin to implement our units of study writing curriculum that was selected last year. So that is something that the teachers will be working on this year. And then we are going to continue to implement our RTI strategies and then begin to implement positive behavior intervention and supports or PBIS, really just the behavior side of RTI that will be piloted in October after back to school nights so we can teach the parents what it's all about. And then another goal is to maintain, maintain consistent school culture and climate survey results. Our results were very high under Mrs. Haleko, so that's a goal of mine to maintain that, and especially under potential construction, which we see will not happen until next year, so that's going to be good. <laughs> um, but just to make sure that we maintain those results and keep that climate positive with the change of leadership in the building. Good evening, everyone. I have pictures in my slides because we're preschool. <laughs> 
Uh, my enrollment slide looks a little different. I don't have a bar graph, and I presented data really from the past two years because that really reflects a consistent model of the type of services we've been providing in preschool. Um, and we've seen significant growth from last year to this year. Um, and I broke it down by category. Um, starting the year with a significantly higher number of students with disabilities, maintaining fairly comparable numbers for at risk. We added a few tuition students to balance out um, some of the classes with the increased number of students with disabilities. So the last count, we had 73 students in the preschool. So as you all know, we added a sixth classroom. And I think the biggest change for us, and it piggybacks a little bit on what um, Ms. Kelly talked about in terms of the types and needs of students with disabilities that we're seeing are the changing needs of the students with disability. And those of you who've been around a bit have probably heard me talk a lot about the different population we see at the preschool and elementary level versus the middle and high school level, although we're starting to see the wave come up to middle school in terms of the intensity of needs uh, this year. S and it's reflected here in our preschool data. Um, we are required to provide services, special education services, and serve children who are two years old by September 30th if they're identified. And last year we had one two-year-old, and this year we started the school year with nine and when you have that many two-year-olds with disabilities, you cannot have the same number of children in a class. So we have right now two classes that are our youngest kind of two, three combo classes, and we have to keep those numbers down a little bit. Thank you for the additional position, Dr. Jones, or we would have been starting at 15 students in a classroom. Um, we have around 10 or 11 students in the two-year-old classes, right, two and three-year-olds. Um, and then we have a three-year-old class, and then we have three classes of, ri two classes of rising kindergartners and one class that's mostly rising kindergartners, but the younger ones, like the August birthday ones, and then the older three-year-olds. So that's kind of the breakdown. But the needs of the two-year-olds require a lot more adult support. We have a lot of children in car seats, for the bus this year. We have a lot of potty pottying and diapers and we had to buy another, find another changing table. So there's been a lot of demands with those two-year-olds. I think the other piece of data I, I pulled out to share with you is the complexity of needs with regard to health. And I think, I know Dr. Jones shares with you division-wide, we gather data on health for how many health plans do we have across the division, how many office visits have we had, et cetera. But for us this year, we have eight students in the preschool with very significant um, medical needs. We have four students with really rare health conditions um, who might require really emergency health plans that are really severe. Um, and then we have three students with compromised immune systems. Um, so we have a lot more need to support sort of the health aid piece of it, which is why when the budget comes along, I'm going to push for some additional support, Jesse Thacker, to help with the health aid issue, because we don't have a health aid. Um, it's Rachel or it's me. Um, and we have students that require medication on a regular basis and so forth. So we have some very unique challenges this year, and I'm so appreciative of Amy Simons, our public health nurse, if you don't know her, is phenomenal, and the support she provides has just been outstanding. In terms of testing, uh, the data I have to share with you is our pre-K PALS. So this is the same instrument that Aaron talked about, except at the preschool level. So some of the items might be a little bit different. And we do administer it three times a year to all of our rising kindergartners, all of our four-year-olds. Um, and what I've done here is, is broken it out by kind of subgroup. Our students with disabilities are at-risk students, and, and at-risk students may mean a number of things. It's not simply just our ESOL students. It includes students who may have families who don't speak English, but it also includes students who might be, um, you know, at home stretch or students who, um, you know, are, have other risk factors such as a, a, a parent not graduating from high school or, you know, homelessness or 
socioeconomic level. So all those students are captured in the at-risk category. And the way I tried to coordinate this so you could, you could kind of see is the diff along the, the bottom access you see the different uh, elements of the pre-K PAL, so name writing, uppercase letters, lowercase letters, et cetera. Sometimes in, in some of those um, subtests are not administered every time if the student doesn't achieve proficiency on, for instance, uppercase letters, they're not tested on lowercase letters yet. So you see a different end sometimes because of the testing um, requirements. But what I've done is show you the blue shows you children who from fall met or exceeded the benchmark. So fall benchmark and they met or exceeded, okay, from below to expected and below to exceed. Okay, so the blue is the kids who already met the benchmark when they started. So in the fall administration, they passed at the level we expected. The red bar shows the children who in the fall assessment were below the expected levels and then met the expected levels at the end of the year. They use the term expected range in this assessment. And the orange bars are children who went from the below, ex below expected levels to exceeds. So the highest, it's below expected exceeds. And so you can see for our students with disabilities, 100% of our students with disabilities met the expected ranges in all of those areas. The same is true for our at-risk students. All the students, 100%, achieved what was expected in each of those subtests. And again, the color breakdown is the same. Blue are kids who in the fall already met it or exceeded it to begin <coughs> with. Red are kids who went from <coughs> below to the expected level and orange went from below to exceeds. So you can kind of see the growth. Ms. Warren? Hmm? Liz, one question. Is there any way you could figure out a better way to describe the colors? Because when I first looked at this, <coughs> I looked at the yellow and I said, oh, that's below exceed. And then the next one was below expected. And the way you explained it was not the opposite of it, but pretty close. Yeah, I can, I can add some clarifying language on the left to try to explain that better. Yeah, I just think, um, it I was think hard to, yeah, it took me quite a bit to figure out what kind of chart to do <laughs> because it was, I wanted to show growth. And, and also to give you a sense of how many of our children start and come into the program already with the prerequisite skills. Um, but I can add some language to try to make that clearer. Yeah, I mean, once you explained it, it was clear, but we can't send you around to everybody to have you explain it. I'll clear, I'll, I'll add some, I'll make it <laughs> more clear. And then uh, these are our uh, tuition paying students. Um, and there was one student that didn't meet all of the ex all of the levels, which is why on the first two items you see the bar is a little bit lower. Um, again, the purple are the children who in the fall already met the benchmark. The red went from below the benchmark to meet the benchmark. The orange went from below to exceed. And for this group, I included meet to exceed because we had more children in this subgroup who started off meeting and still grew to the higher level. And I wanted to capture that. And this is our data in pictures. Um, I think, you know, we certainly do a lot of really engaging, hands-on learning um, with our students and teachers take a lot of data that's not represented well in a bar graph, right? Anecdotal data, observational data, um, portfolio snapshots of students. Um, our teachers take pictures and have various ways to share that, the, the, the story with their uh, parents. Um, so I think it's important just for the board to know that data looks different in preschool. <coughs> we use other data so sources that are more authentic, kind of like what Mr. Swanson said, having the right assessments for the right children developmentally. And some of our strategic initiatives um, piggyback on, on what you heard from the other schools as we try to really look and focus on our pre-K through 12 uh, vertical articulation. We are focusing on uh, implementation of the second step program um, with Fidelity in our three older classrooms. Um, this is a um, uh, a kind of a program that incorporates a brief kind of lesson that's incorporated during circle time and is teaching children positive pro-social types of behaviors. Um, so we're excited about that. Last year we did it a little bit, but we didn't have the kits. And this year 
with the PBIS grant, we were able to get a second one, and then we found a third one when we cleaned the closets. So now we have three, and we're all set. Um, we're also focusing on just exploring and thinking about our sort of school-wide positive behavioral supports and positive behavioral interventions and supports, um, and just starting the conversations. We're not implementing anything. We're implementing Second Step this year. But we're going to start the dialogue so that we can have some school-wide um, systems in place. Because we do see an increasing number and I'm pleased with the focus on the positive behavior intervention supports division-wide. Um, some of you may or may not be aware that, for instance, there's been some recent um, communication with regard to the need for PBIS kinds of interventions for students with disabilities um, that they be in place. And if not, and students you know, do something wrong or have a disciplinary infraction, that that can be problematic. So we're ahead of the curve, really trying to put everything in place, and it's really exciting to see the work that these guys have done, and some of their matrixes are just phenomenal. So I'm really, I appreciate the support for my other hat with the children <laughs> with disabilities. Um, this year, our STEAM uh, action plan is to implement an engineering lab, and that really is um, going to be spearheaded by one of our teachers who's done this before, and it's basically kids building and creating things with a bunch of stuff that's probably trash that you'd throw away. So we're going to be a very hands-on, very open-ended. Um, so we're going to be messaging out for donations and collections of things that we can use and, and working, having Miss Catherine work with our teachers on that implementation. And finally, piggybacking on everyone's comments about culture and climate, I mean, one, we have a, a vision that's been established for Jesse Thackeray, and what we did this year at our um, back to school kind of meeting training is focus on okay you know what are our, what kind of a cult, what are our cultural commitments that we are going to make to one another our our core beliefs and what would be the ways we would have evidence of those of that of those cultural statements and we came up with three with the whole team three different sort of statements about what we believe um, and things that we would expect to see if we were honoring and consistent with our culture. So um, those dialogues are continuing. I actually the teach, I had everybody fill out a little kind of a form, an anonymous form to sort of say, you know, how are we doing now? Like, where's our baseline? And talking and having conversations about, because we have a lot of new people. We have a new team. So we're trying to, you know, build our team together and kind of take us to the next level. So focusing on that cultural piece is another priority for us. All right. You want to click for me, Liz? Okay. If you want to click. <laughs> All right. And click one more time. All right. We're going to go back and start looking at our LEP um, pass rates, which is limited English proficient, which is also referred to as ESOL, which is now referred to as English <laughs> learners um, from the ESEA um, Act that came out um, this summer. That That's how they want us to refer to um, students who have a second language. So we will now start referring to them as the L's, e English learners. So here, when you look at the reading and writing, you can see that they have made um, great growth. And we attribute that to some of the instructional practices that we've put in K-12. Um, I know Paul spoke to what we've done at um, TJ, but we've done a lot at the middle and high school as well with um, instructional practices to enhance what our teachers are doing with those students. But when you look at the history, math, science, you'll see that we're not exactly where we'd like to be for those students. And I was saying the reading and writing, we have, we have time to things that we need to grow on as well. But when you look and you see that, that that's going down a little bit, um, we would attribute that to the language acquisition, which is how students acquire language and begin to perceive that language and also comprehend the language. And, you know, in history and math, the vocabulary is very rich. Um, it's not necessarily language that, you know, is easy to comprehend sometimes for our students who don't have um, English as a second language. So that's one of the things that we'll be focusing on this year with our teachers to really work on the language acquisition piece to help students with the vocabulary and, and tying it in, and um, looking, looking at different strategies to, to make sure that we address those needs. 
Um, ESOL proficiency growth based on our WIDA access for L's. This is a test that's administered every spring to our students. Um, you'll see as a division we're at 92 percent, um, which we're, we're proud of that. Um, at all of our schools we're right around, you see, 88 to 90 plus percent. Um, and that's, their, that's the percentage of growth that all of our students made. So as we look at the, go ahead to the next slide, Liz. Um, about three years ago, we picked seven students to focus on and to chart their growth. And so you'll look tonight at how these students have, have progressed over the three years, where they are now. So our student number one is now in exit year two. You can see um, the student was 3.6 um, four years ago and now has exited last year and is in the second year of exit. And I, you'll see that it says the FLEP plan. And what the FLEP plan is, it's a formally limited English proficient plan for students. So students who are monitored, we still have a plan in place for them to make sure that we are addressing their needs and we address it with the ESOL specialist but also with our reading specialists and math specialists um, since they're monitored. So they're not directly on the ESOL teachers or L teachers um, caseload. Um, you'll see that this student passed the reading SOL um, for the last two years um, and with a higher score each year. Um, she's currently receiving tier three math intervention through the RTI process. Will that become the FEL plan now? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to still be flat for a while. Um, exit, our student number two was, is in exit year one. That's, that means that they just exited this spring. And when you look at it's 5.9 um, as the WIDA level, if a student receives a 5.0 in the composite score and a 5.0 in the literacy score, they can be exited from um, the, the actual services. It doesn't mean that we don't still watch those students and make sure that they, um, their needs are met. But this student um, passed the, his SOL in the 15-16 school year and also showed a year's growth in, on the STAR reading exam. Um, he's currently in honors English and geometry. Um, and um, we, we believe that, you know, his, at, if you look at his um, trend line, that's, that's kind of hel helped him get to where he is today. But the student has made a lot of growth. And actually, I'm not going to have you click through it, but when I speak to three, I'm going to speak to three, four, and five. These students are all, at this point, dual identified. Um, they're both um, ESOL as well as students with disabilities, um, and their instructional needs are being met and monitored through their individualized education plan. So our special education teachers and ESOL specialists are working together um, to make sure that the students' needs are being met. Um, and they're, you know, we're trying to make sure that you know, the ESOL teacher is working on the language acquisition and our special education teachers are working on other um, of the various needs that the student may have. Our student number four, again, as I said, the same thing is dual identified. Um, and you'll see that, you know, at sometimes their, the growth is a little bit slower. You'll see that this particular student was a 4.9 in 2014-15, um, then 4.6, and now is up to 5.3. So sometimes we look as they, as they progress and they get older, um, we just have to, they don't maybe not grow as much and maybe at a kind of flat line, but you can see this, this student did make growth this year, so we're excited about that. But we'll continue to really closely monitor um, this student with, through with the ESOL teacher and special education teacher. And then five um, is a, this is the same dual identified student. Um, we do believe based on this trend line that the student will exit um, the program this year if the trend line continues to move in this direction. Um, student number six is at exit year three. That means they have been out and monitored for the last, um, last three years. Um, passed all SOLs, including the end of course English class. Is currently enrolled in AP Calculus. Um, and has shown significant growth in the STAR reading last year, an instructional level from a 6.1 to 11.3. And then our last seven, our seventh student actually moved out of the division this year. Um, and that kind of speaks to, you, we've been looking at these students for the last three years, and out of that seven, only one has moved out. So it does say that our students do stay with us um, in the school division. We did have this one moved out and was with us for three years. Um, so we didn't have any data. And then you want to speak to the VDOE updates, Jeannie? Okay. Can I ask a question? Oh, sure. You go back to, like, the slide, like two or three slides back. Okay, there. This one? Five? Uh, yeah, this, this will do. Okay. So, you're looking at WIDA for 2015 to 16, mm -hmm. at a 4.7. This academic year 
I guess we've been in only two weeks. No, no. The scores, the, when you look at the score, the 16, 17 year is based on the test that they took last spring. Yeah. So we got the re results in June, but this is, this is the level for this school year right. that we'll be monitoring. Yes. In two weeks. Okay. It determines the status this is, how we program it, for them. Yeah, it determines the status <laughs> for the year, for the 16, 17 school year. All right, just some VDOE updates. Every year the state rolls something new out when it comes to assessment. And the things that are coming up for this spring, we had the computer adaptive testing was in third grade last year. And this year they are adding it now for fourth and fifth grade. The difference with the computer adaptive testing is that it is shorter. And instead of taking two days to have to do the assessment, we can now break that down to one day. So it does um, limit the amount of testing our students have to do at the elementary level. The other component they're adding is the now they're putting in computer adaptive testing for, for the reading as well um, will be started in the spring. And then some other things just with VDOE, they offer a lot of professional development for our teachers. A lot of this professional development is usually paid for by the state and our teachers can attend for free. So we have, we are sending right now to Excel 101 Institute is a professional development opportunity for teachers who want to support our L students or ESOL learners more and be able to understand the type of um, instructional strategies that are um, successful to use with these students to help them grow. So I currently have uh, teachers ranging from all, all four buildings are going to be attending. I think we're up to about six teachers will be going to this training coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, PEP parent as educational partners. In the past, we've sent um, some teachers this. This is also for uh, mostly um, ESOL uh, parents who don't speak English. And it's a way for us as a school division to reach out to these parents and also do some some um, lessons with them and most of those lessons are based on how to understand s what school is for their kids what is a report card what why do we have to have immunization so we have to help these parents as well because the united states school system is much different than what many of them are used to so it's a program that does support uh the families not just the <coughs> student uh, this year we um, tried Mr. Swanson was, was going to attend, but unfortunately he is currently on a waiting list. So we're hoping that he can also be able to go to that um, institute. The history SOL, there have been some changes to the history SOLs. Uh, the, most of them are pretty much at the elementary level. We've been working with the teachers on revising some of their curriculum. And this is our year for finishing that curriculum because it needs to go into effect next year. So we ha are sending um, teachers from every building. Most of them are curriculum instruction resource teachers that will be attending. They will come back then and work with their departments on those changes and revising their curriculum to make sure that they have it updated. And then the um, VACMS, Coaching for Balanced and Connected Mathematics. This is a institute for our um, math certs that we're sending again as our teacher leaders. And there are going to be some SOL changes for math coming up as well. So they're going to get that information firsthand and be able to come back and, and share it with their departments. We are also working a lot on revising our scope and sequence um, for math. We're starting with um, Thomas Jefferson branching off to Mount Daniel and trying to streamline that process to make sure we're not missing anything and, and getting some resources together to make things easier on teachers. So that's, those are the updates. Questions? Anyone? Always. Mr. Lawrence. Uh, two things for you, Jeannie. In the beginning, you talked about the adaptive math scores, I think it was for third grade, that you said had dropped because you thought, you thought they had dropped because of the adaptive test. Well, there's different things, not just because of that. There's a few different things that we're taking a look at. We're thinking that that 
could be a component, mostly because that was third grade. It's the first time these kids have ever taken an, an SOL test online. So not only do they have to know how to take an SOL test, but now they also have all these computer adaptive tools that they have to figure out. So if they aren't familiar with that, that kind of gets in the way of the knowledge component. So we're looking at making sure that they have some more practice on working with the technology before they actually have to sit for the test. So that's one component. One, that, mm -hmm. one of the things that it <coughs> didn't happen until the General Assembly actually took action, like later in the year. So we didn't know it was coming. And one of the things they do in elementary generally is really have children practice to check your work. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you get through the test. And then at the end, you go back and you do all the ones that you weren't sure about. What well, computer adaptive, it's a one shot yeah. deal. So the kid answers the question, you can't go back. And so teachers across the state had to change very quickly this year to make sure that kids understood, oh, no, you can't really go back and check your work and change your answers. That's very different. That's cool. So are schools required to use computer adaptive? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. And so if you're doing math, I, I'm just thinking about myself. Do, do they get scrap paper or anything to oh, yeah. do? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm just, mm -hmm. okay. And what I think, you know, is there any initiative to go back so that kids can go back and check their work or? You know, yeah. you can't skip a question now and be like, I'm going to go back to that later. No, you can't. Mm -hmm. And with it being computer adaptive, it's based on the skill level. If, you know, if your student gets a lot of questions correct, it goes to a higher level mm -hmm. of questions versus it's really if they're not getting children. it correct, it goes. Yeah. The level of questioning goes down. And it, it helps with frustration as well. Um, if a student is just not getting the skill, then it'll it'll back down the question a little bit. I mean, bit the first year we the gave level. this assessment, we had 10-year-olds that were taking three and four hours yeah, to take that. an assessment. It was awful. And then the next year, they changed and allowed us to at least give it over two days. But part of the idea of computer adaptive is children should be taking assessments that are appropriate for them. So if you don't, if you're not ready for fourth grade level material, it's not it's not it's unkind really to have a child sit there for three hours um, trying to do that. So it it constantly adjusts the assessments um, the other thing is the interactive piece is has been new for us as well other questions Mr. Yeah. okay so to follow on that so you wouldn't be expecting a drop in math scores for four to five or reading scores for three to five because they're also going to be adaptive well, we hope that they don't drop. I mean, we're going knowing that they're computer fourth graders are the ones who did it as third graders, so they at least know what's coming. Yeah, and knowing that it is computer adaptive, our teachers will then know that and will prepare all year for for the computer adaptive, the whether it's a drag and drop question, but really the the Department of Ed has they do have release items that teachers can now use to help students gain gain knowledge on how to use the equipment because it, it's all online. Okay. All of our tests are online, unless there's a there's a reason that they shouldn't take an online test. Okay, and then for the VDOE professional development, is maybe I missed this? Is that required or just recommended, or what is? I mean, it's yeah, it's great it's to see that it's out that. there, but what is it? Yeah. Mean? It's just offered. The state sends out um, the information that they're going to offer an institute. They usually ask for a team to come, and it's all optional. You can go, you don't have to go, but they like to save seats for every school division. Like for example, the um, the one that is coming up for history, they they actually would prefer like a special ed teacher attends and the gen teacher responsible for the content and an administrator. So they do look for teams so that they can collaborate during the institute and talk about how the standards should be differentiated for certain learners and, and, and so on. So it's, it's all run by the state and it's offered. And we have so many seats and we usually don't get more than that unless somebody else doesn't go, then they open it up. And we do encourage our staff to go because it's also a networking opportunity to hear what other school divisions are doing um, that, you know, things that we can share with them as well as things we can bring back for our students to help help us move forward. Great. Thank you. Other questions? I don't want to keep you too long, but I had two, two questions. Um, first of which is what impact do you think technology has had on student achievement? Oh, if I could comment from the, not from the preschool perspective, but one of the things that technology has done for some <coughs> of our students with disabilities is really helped to give them access 
um, and allow for more authentic kinds of measures of what they know. For instance, if we do have students, for instance, who are dyslexic um, and they can't write in the traditional way and they can't, maybe they can't spell really well. So the accessibility features of the Mac have been really powerful for a lot of our students. Um, to allow them to write and generate things because they're perfectly capable of doing that, but they just can't do it without these special tools. So one of the things from the special education side that technology has done is, is has provided ways for our students with disabilities to access the curriculum and participate at their level um, and not be hindered by their disability. <clears throat> and at, at the high school level, um, very similarly, where we are now creating a level playing field, uh, an equitable environment. Um, I, I see exactly what Liz is talking about, where our students with disabilities are now able to do certain things they once were not able to do. Uh, I think it has such a tremendous impact because um, ultimately we're creating an environment where you have now these authentic learning experiences. So um, I talk about that a lot when I do my personalized learning sessions where we have parents come in and they want to know what's the difference and we, you know, basically show images of what when we were in school. Uh, when you have the, 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 the professor standing and lecturing and there's not the um, collaboration, there's not um, students being challenged and they're able to do many of these things in project-based uh, items that they're able to uh, create through tech, uh, the use of technology. So it's, um, it's something that I believe strongly in, we believe strongly in, and I think it's something that we'll, we'll continue to make sure our students have access. <laughs> it's more used as a tool it's never a replacement for any kind of instruction but one large difference that I've seen coming from a district that didn't have the tools is when our students are in a guided reading group with a teacher and the other students are doing their own rotations the technology provides a way for them to have guided practice set up by the teacher that gives them immediate feedback Whereas instead of them doing three worksheets for the other 45 minutes, they may do one worksheet with the paraprofessional. They might do a station on an iPad where it's telling them if they're getting the right answer. It's talking to them. It's leading them through the activity instead of them sitting there and doing an activity wrong three times and then never getting any feedback on it. Um, so that, I think, has really helped with our individualized instruction and providing the students with the feedback that they need even when they're not in that small group with their teacher. Next. Thank you. At TJ, I would certainly agree with everything that you've heard thus far. I think I would probably add maybe one or two other elements to this. It's kind of ironic that we have been here for however many minutes tonight, and we've looked at a lot of numbers, necessarily so important numbers. But I think we also know that there is far, far more to what is going on in this community than just testing. And I think technology has really been a window and a door for a lot of our kids. Let me give you a specific example. Uh, we talked, had a meeting even this morning about kids that were working on mapping skills. And 20 years ago, 10 years ago, we could not have had kids sit down at a computer and click on Google Earth and see the globe. So I think when we think about things like the primary years program and IB, I think technology has played probably a pivotal role in, in opening up the globe to our kids. Thank you. Um, so one other question. This is kind of a little off topic, but not too much. So um, I, I have, you know, we've been looking at the enrollment numbers, which have gone up about six and a half percent, and that we've got some grade levels where you know we're at 24 or 25 in the classroom, and some of this budgetary talk will come at a later date. But my kind of wild guess is that we're looking, we're well over a dozen headcount needed division-wide, and I was just wondering, at this point, you'll get to come back and talk about this later, what kind of needs are you 
foreseeing to maintain the quality of instruction that, that we've seen this year and in years past. You don't have to give me head count, but could, could you start getting us thinking about what we need to be budgeting for uh, because that season will be upon us very soon? Yeah, absolutely. I think the numbers allude exactly to what, what we're talking about. Um, I think Ty said it best. I mean, we're using, we're using all the rooms but the bathrooms at this point. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what it comes down to. So space, space is definitely going to be a key item. Um, when we basically moved all of our six teachers out of the trailers into the building, we are at uh, absolute capacity at this point. So, you know, we don't have any additional classrooms. Uh, we even have a, a middle school class that we're currently running in, in our building. So we're, we're completely, um, completely book solid, if you will. And so I think space is definitely something we need to think about. Uh, teachers, obviously, you know, as we take a look at the numbers, uh, we do have uh, a few teachers who have reached that, that 120 threshold that we talk about in our policy. Um, I think, you know, across the board, it, it, we're going to get to a point where we're going to need certain teachers in, in different areas and also just um, probably more of a balance. I noticed that in, in, you know, in some of our content areas, we'll have one, one more teacher, uh, maybe nine teachers as opposed to eight teachers. So making sure that we're balanced across the board, we're meeting the needs of the students and taking a look at each content area uh, specifically, whether it's, you know, not maybe putting science in the same category, let's say our, our PE classes. Uh, obviously those numbers are going to be a little bit different. Uh, so I think that's something that we need to pinpoint moving forward. Can I go next? Let me go next. <laughs> yeah. In some regards, I think that that is a tough question to answer because enrollment is, is probably still an open question. But I think there are two things that come to mind at TJ. I do think that we need to look at ESOL staff. Can we get the job done with the staff that we have now? I would say yes but there's there's some headwinds depending on enrollment and then i think um, probably another question that comes up for us is encore special teachers that we're getting to that place where for instance in third grade we have 10 sections right now of third grade so we have seven encore teachers if we would ever get to a place where we add an 11th section we're talking about having to really rethink the way we handle Encore because we're going to be looking at gym classes, for instance, that, and I reserve the right to change my mind here, but we could be looking, <laughs> we could be looking potentially at 33, 34, 35 kids in a gym class if we didn't do anything else. And, you know, as, as Matt said, it's not just a staffing issue, it's a space issue. If we had to put someplace else, and we still, I think, have a few nooks and crannies at TJ that we could make work, um, but if we had to add another couple of classrooms, we would need to really rethink operationally how we would do that. Um, we are very similar. We're lucky to be, hopefully, solving our space issue here in the somewhat near future. So we're very grateful for that. Um, but staffing is going to be our number one. I mean, kindergarten is a grid level that's already over capacity and the teachers are doing a great job of working with the kids. But when you have two to four extra kids in your room, that's a whole nother guided reading group. So that's 20 minutes of instruction in addition to what they're already doing for their hour of language arts time. So it becomes a, a time issue for the students in a class size issue in terms of the small group instruction that we're used to giving. Um, and also looking forward, I think our Encore model is going to need to be looked at it as well because right now there are some gaps in the schedules and those teachers are doing STEAM activities during lunch and recess and all kinds of enrichment, but there aren't enough gaps for 10 sections of second grade. Um, so we are really gonna have to think about, not for next school year, but moving forward, how do we organize that schedule to make sure, and I mean, they're nowhere near as 
front loaded as your teachers are, but we're really going to need to look at our structure, which hopefully the building will let us to be a little more flexible with that because the gym and the cafeteria will be separate spaces. <laughs> so our special schedule will not have to run around lunchtime anymore, but we are going to have to get creative with that. And those teachers are going to have to be prepared to potentially have almost 200 more kids on their course load. So that's going to be different. Um, and as I said in the presentation, special education is changing. We're actually in a pretty good place with our ESOL students. Not that can change every year with getting a new bunch of kindergartners, but um, our special education students, we're down a teacher this year because of the numbers, which is fine, but the, the kids are needier. Um, and then when the kindergarten class comes in and we get a couple that we weren't expecting, we're feeling that pressure right now. So. I would expect that if this group stays with us and with what we're expecting from Jesse Thackeray, we'll be asking for some additional support in that area and looking forward to a bigger school. We're the only school that doesn't have a special education administrator. So that falls on Jeremy and I, which right now is fine, but with second grade, I think could become a little bit more cumbersome and that team could need that person to look towards to, to be the leader of that <coughs> to make sure we're doing what's right for our kids. I'll speak in terms of two things, one Jesse Thackeray and one special ed system-wide. Um, in terms of Jesse Thackeray, we definitely, I think, really need some additional support to help out with, to help Rachel out in terms of the health room aid and the clerical support. And I don't know if you realize that she does everything. She does the registration, she does the health aid. and. And so she's not able to get in classrooms and do some of the other things that we know would really benefit the program. Um, I'm also watching and considering the need for some additional, um, an additional paraprofessional position there with the young classes. We only have one class. We have one extra para that we can put somewhere. So we're struggling this year even with some of the other young, you know, younger classes not having a third person that can go in and, you know, even so that someone can step out and go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, in terms of special education system wide, I see the needs um, at the elementary level, Mount Daniel um, and TJ, I'd love to see at 0.6 get bumped up to a 1.0. One of the things that we've been doing for special education, um, particularly at um, TJ and MEH, we've been continuing each year to work on our continuum of services, the way in which we deliver services. So we have a flexible continuum to meet the dif different needs of the children. So this year at MEH, for the first time, with the additional position we added there for special education, we're able to have kind of a resource model. So someone who can work with students and push in and pull small groups kind of across grades if necessary, which gives us a lot more capability. Um, to meet the needs of students. At TJ, we would love to be able to get to that point. We can't do it yet with the number of students and the number of staff, but we'd love to have someone who could serve in that resource capacity rather than being a co-teacher or pulling out. Um, and then at Mount Daniel, I think, you know, we'll need to look at that special education teaching position. The other thing I'm watching really closely is our speech pathologist, um, at the preschool and uh, Mount Daniel level because the needs at, for instance, this year, Mary, I think she has 24 students right now, which is probably what, you know, other folks might have that are full time and the needs are so complex and we haven't really thought about staffing based on complexity of needs. We do that for special ed teachers, but pretty much it's straight numbers for speech pathologists. And as our needs get more diverse, I think we need to factor that in. Um, but I think staffing at middle and high school for special ed is fine for next year. All right, well, thank you very much. And do you want to talk about support? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, that was only the certified. So when you talk about 14 or 15 right. positions, um, we're having huge, and I think they could all, and you feel free to speak to not having added custodial staff, not having uh, added kitchen staff. I mean, all of those areas um, are, are, this is the year. I mean, we haven't, it's been a decade for some of those areas. Okay, just, just want to manage expectations and, and start thinking about what we're going to be facing. So, well, thank you, A, for coming out tonight, and B, coming out every other day of the week. We appreciate everything you do. So thank you, and you're welcome to stay and 
visit with us or you can go home to your family. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, now we come to the next item on our agenda. <coughs> I made some <coughs> inquiries about search firms. Uh, I guess our, our plan to hire Dr. Garza as the interim, interim superintendent is not well, the door. It just went out the um, window. <laughs> but, but in all seriousness, uh, we, we did receive the materials from VSBA. VSBA was used last time as the search firm. And you know, one of the threshold questions we have is, are we going to spend some time examining our options with respect to search firms? Um, the, the cost for VSBA, um, given that we just went over 2,500 students, uh, we're going to pay a little more than we did last time and with expenses and fees. You know, it'll be somewhere in the teens. Um, there are... This is permanent or interim? This is for the permanent now. We're, we're talking, yeah, we're, we're, sorry I wasn't clear about that, but we're talking about the permanent. Um, there could be other firms out there um, where the costs would be. Uh, I did some research and, and in some instances school districts were a little surprised that the, the cost of the engagement was basically doubled by expenses. Um, mm. I, I talked with one firm that said <coughs> we would be about 16000 for the fee. So it, there, there are various tiers of superintendent searches and superintendents. There's the, the Fairfax size um, engagement or the, you know, Los Angeles kind of uh, mega district searches those can run into multiple tens of thousands of dollars sometimes even into six figures um, I, I don't think we're there but I think we have several options where the range could be in the mid teens up into the up into the 20s and you know one of the threshold questions for us as a board is do we want to issue some kind of solicitation? Do we want to entertain some proposals? Uh, is the comfort level with VSBA from last time around such that we uh, would like to just proceed with that option? Um, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts? Mr. Webb. Quick question. I, um, did we do um, RFP for this for last time or did they just go directly to VSBA. VSBA. It was just VSBA, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Ankumi, you look like you want to say something. No pressure. Okay. <laughs> to, is it possible to get a, a quote estimate from other parties, private, the private sector? Um, we, we, can, we can definitely do that. Uh, Mr. Horn, I don't know from a from a procurement standpoint, um, what the best approach for that is, or whether we can just issue requests for bids to individual entities, or whether we should put out a solicitation. What, what are your, what is your? The ultimate there? procurement it will be based on the dollar figure that we spend. So there are purchasing guidelines below and above certain thresholds. It appears that the numbers you've described would fall under the small purchasing guidelines, which wouldn't require you to um, perform any specific tasks, specifically issue a competitive RFP or negotiate specifically with low bidders or anything along those lines. So um, you, you have options to informally explore pricing with private entities if you want prior to making a decision to go with one. Because of the because of the threshold, should and we get should we get numbers what, back? Sixty five or something? sixty thousand. Sixty. Okay. Excuse me. So does the process start with them telling us what they would charge for a search, or there is it there they there are they can prepare proposals. They some of them may be willing to come and make presentations. Um, so it, it's. Uh, we could we could request written proposals. Um, I, I think it 
obviously for this amount of money you're not going to get somebody on the west coast probably flying out here to do a presentation um but could we get a, a, a written scoping and and uh description of what they would be willing to do for what price and what additional modules would cost i think absolutely but um, you know there there are several names that if you look up superintendent search um, recur some of them not always positively um, and I, I, I guess the question is just how how much we would like to do in way in the way of exploration I think we we have a little bit of time where we can do that um, I think it just comes down to what the what the sentiment on the board is about this aspect of things these these this organization whoever it is because I think we are in agreement that we will not go this alone um, will be instrumental in helping to find candidates helping to engage in the, the community discussions and engagement so they they will be a, a trusted partner in this process so I don't think it's something we want to do lightly um, I guess my sense is whatever we ask for would be nothing new to them right this is what they do. They have, this is their job. Um, and that includes the whole community engagement and all the involved and all that stuff, right? Right. And, and some, depending on where you go and what you choose, you may get more robust sets of, of features and uh, services than others. So you, you could have varying levels of, you know, very big community engagement oriented firm versus one that is perhaps less so so there there could be some gradations in in the scope of services although i'm sure anybody is willing to do more for, and, us, and, for more money so so if we if we back up if we if we back if as a backstop we use the template miss wadiska gave us would that be a good starting point for here's the scope of what we would like you to do and issue us and make a presentation give, or send us something give us a proposal or something what that, would entail? And what that would entail if we sort of generally agree that we would like to follow that process you know is that a good starting point to say all right here it is how much money think? would that cost well i guess it, it <coughs> hadn't occurred to me that a firm would help us with the public outreach i mean i understand why they could like we did it with you know george mason and other things but i i really had them segmented as doing the search as opposed to the public outreach so the fact that you just raised well that. I think part of it is they help develop what it is we're looking for in the superintendent so that's the nexus between oh they the, go together it just didn't yeah. occur to me that they would be doing anything other than watching what we do I mean it, it would make sense that people would do that to help yeah. you understand what people are telling you and to get the most out of it rather than just holding you know town hall meetings where people can stand up and say whatever they want and then you walk away sort of scratching your head it, i'm just saying it hadn't occurred to me to have somebody help devise the public outreach as well as the search and and if it's a and if we get to save some money by not doing that that's fine right i just thought it it's sort of like a eventually almost like a complete package and you go look here's what we like to do What's it going to cost us? I mean, one thing I would still like to do, and I, I know I raised it before, I would love if we could get Joan and Susan and Kieran to come in and let us pick their brains. Because the, the letter that Joan sent was great for what they did. What I'm curious about is, do they think that applies to what we are now, which is, I think, a very different system in terms of you know, overall size and direction? You know, she added in about all the social media and everything. We shouldn't reinvent the wheel. I think the problem is we've got a very different wheel now. So I'd be mm -hmm. curious, you know, between the two of them, or the three of them, they've got, what, like 35 years of experience on our school boards. I mean, Joan has obviously been doing education since forever. I would love to be able to, to grill them. You know, you did it this way. Would you do it this way again? <coughs> Because I'm willing to bet the answer is no, but then the interesting part is what would they want to do differently? And we, and we may not obviously do everything they say, but I would love to be able to rely on their experience just to 
see what they think. You know, if you were sitting on the board now, is this what you would do? I like that I, idea. I, I think I, it's a good place to start. I mean, I, I'd like to start somewhere small and and so I can get a feel for what this whole process is about, but I'm I'm definitely interested in hiring a firm to help us as well. But I think we need to get we need to understand what's going on and where we want to be before we can even talk to a firm. So I th I like that idea of if they're willing to come and maybe speak to us and answer or do a question and answer. Um, I think it'd be great. Uh, that input is would be valuable. I'm just wondering how f how fo how formalized do you want that input? Uh, as in, I, I I want it as more a give and take. A Q and A. I mean, as as formal as we would get to me would be Joan's letter that really laid out things, you know, with the links, laid out a process, and explained it. I don't think we need more than that from them. I mean, it, other people want something else. I guess what you're asking is a session similar to what we had with the mm -hmm. with the principals, right? Yeah. yeah. Where they essentially constitute some sort of a, a panel and share their thoughts. Yeah, and then get asked a lot of questions from people who didn't have to go through it then but have to go through it now so you know we've got a lot of responsibility that we've never had and they've got a lot of, a lot of knowledge that we don't okay just don't yeah fine. i mean it's it's you know a, a larger group i don't think it costs us anything no it's just it's it's a, we'd learn a lot time, um but but other than that i mean i i, I think uh, i i do think that there is a question of there's a baseline level of stuff that you can do and then i think there's a question of is there incremental stuff that we want to do as well and i don't know the answer to that and i think that may be where some of the conversation leads us but but i, I think it, it <coughs> the only thing we'll end up is is smarter after a meeting like that yeah so I absolutely right that. well all i'd say is let's not one hold the the other right your search for or your the search for the firm shouldn't be shouldn't be contingent on that discussion i think they go together right yeah. but one of the questions i would want to ask is did you consider search firms before and if so why did you choose to go with vsba and not the search firm i mean that's the kind of question that could be very helpful and their answer may be at the time it made sense now you know you're bigger and everything and i i they might want to do it differently but that's the kind of question i would want to ask them did you go down this road before and if you went this way just tell us why you went that way it's not telling us we should but it's just telling us you're thinking did <clears throat> did um susan kieran and um joan all were they all in agreement because I, I just i spoke to charlotte highland i ran into her <laughs> about Oh, and Charlotte. Should I forgot be, Charlotte. Should we, should should her to so that, she said yeah. that you know she said that they they did have a difference of opinion on the board at that time about what they should do in terms of the search. So it might be good to hear. Oh yeah, no. I don't. I mean, I don't know the history of it, so I don't know if it'd be good to hear like both sides of and how they came to their their conclusion. Yeah, no, I I didn't pick them because yeah, I, I thought they agreed no, no, because no, no. I know several of them frequently disagree and continue to, which is you know also going to be interesting. But yeah, Charlotte is absolutely key so okay. when, when you see her apologize that i forgot no 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 i, no, I didn't mean that i just made you know okay, so we have so, a diversity of views so should we invite <coughs> our school board members to come and and engage with us on this uh and then also do you want me to send out some initial queries for some proposals about scope and pricing and possible services to yeah, some I, yes I, I would yes, go ahead yes. that I think you can do that on a I, I did already I, I reached out to one company called Hazard Young that does a, a lot of well-known work and they are they, they said you want us to I had I said I have some questions and they said do you want a proposal and they said sure we'll give you a proposal so they're they're working on that so I'm happy to uh, to reach out to four or five others and and get some information from them so so let's do that we're going to do both at the same simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Dr. Jones, with respect to costs. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Mr. Kimball and I, because we know this is coming, um, we've been trying to work on kind of the, the cost accounting for the beginning of the year, and I'm gonna, I'll pass this out and then kind of walk you through it just so that you know where, what the numbers are. Hunter did a good job trying to give us some good information. And I apologize it's not on board. Doc Smarty is away on vacation. It's because I was ignorant and could not figure out how to get on there. I, um, I just couldn't. I, I, I found where to do a link. I just for some reason couldn't find where to get the attachment on there. So. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and she usually does that. So I'm going to start you on the back page just to kind of show you what, what happens this time of the year. So what you're looking at is this time of the year we go in and we look at is there any any at all uh, payroll surplus. So if you turn back and there's like yellow and then green and then down at the bottom. And we go in and we say, okay, and this is after we've hired everybody and somebody retires and you hired a first year teacher <coughs> in your place. Um, you know, where did the admin team, we had, ad, you know, administrator switches, were we in the positive or in the negative there? And Hunter goes and looks at that number, and then you have to look at what are the things we already know are unplanned expenses. And right now, this is what we've been working on with the principal team. When you ask them that budget question, actually, on staffing, we're already working on that so that Hunter's really well informed. But these are things they're asking for today and especially based off of um, the enrollment growth. So most of these, I think, a lot of these the school board are aware of. We know we have the sewage issue, you know, that we ended up not being able to get the insurance for, so we've got to find funding for that. We also know that we will be back in this fiscal year now with Mount Daniel. We have to, we'll have to hire the movers, have to hire the shuttle, to build a shuttle teachers from March, April. Um, so that's built in in the center section. These are some of the things you heard principals mention tonight. Um, Hunter and I asked them the question over this last week, is there anything we can do in your buildings to release some of the pressure? Um, where, because they're all just really feeling the enrollment growth. And what you'll see in here, for instance, at TJ, now they're at 823, that second guidance counselor is only part-time. They're saying, can we please bump her up? Um, that it should, and, and by the planning factors, they should have more guidance now. Um, we've got like the special education para we already have somebody just on a time card right now that we had to put in uh, literally the second day of school for one of our kiddos we knew needed it somebody um, Liz uh, talked about the clerical support they're absolutely dying with 75 kids over there I think she said 73 tonight I don't know where the other two went but um, <laughs> maybe they're all coming um, but the clerical support the additional textbooks when you enroll more kids yeah. we're short actually um, we had computer insurance we have power school expenses do you pay per student on some of these things so when you see more enrollment your per student prices go up we, we did go out and purchase more computers for the additional enrollments yep. so, yeah. and the lunch remade that you'll see in the middle <coughs> that's middle school they're just really struggling trying to get some help and they don't have their principals do it they have some teachers that are filling in right now but they're needing some some help in their lunchroom we are going to have additional IB exams based off of the enrollment and we know that's coming uh, TJ reading that it's should math. be math, math. right yes. again Sorry. it has to do with their numbers it's just trying and, and it's not a big number but you'll see they all add up um, tutoring for our at-risk students we needed to bump that up a little bit that's what Matt was talking about where they really do individualize for kids 100% um, graduation yeah special education materials again that's where we're over you know in numbers do you have to have more resources um, the employee assistance expense um, that is just that's a, a service that our staff actually access and we knew that we were under uh, budgeted there and right? we Did added and we added staff so it's <laughs> yeah the, first step, um, yeah. the leave payout that's something that when people are leaving in the middle of the year um, that hits in the middle of the year not at the end of the year where we can kind of look at that so that's just you know drawing that out the superintendent search number just to kind of clarify that um, that 15,000 is just that base number out of the VSBA. We just we actually got the number of not knowing you already had it. <laughs> but you also have to realize that doesn't include any of what they call the in-house expenses. That's just the search firm fee. Mm -hmm. So when you have, for instance, six you know candidates you may narrow down to that fly in from around the country, you have to pay their hotel, you have to pay their airfare, and you'll do that two or three times as you narrow the pool down. Um, so that's not reflected in here. We probably should. Is, is, that, that number is in. that bill to the search firm or is that yeah. bill no, we they, separately? They do it differently. VSBA, assuming they haven't changed their process, it went to the school <coughs> division and then the school division did it out of the operating, like Hazard Young that you're talking about. Yeah, um, and actually the search firm handles just all of it. So better. it just, they each have their own process. Okay. But you that's not built in here. Page. So this probably should be 30,000 to be honest. Um, but it's just the question is, there, are there three slugs or, you know, so. 
Yeah. Um, the interim athletic director, again, that's we talked about that, I think, at the last board meeting, the one before. That's making sure we've got that coverage uh, for our games. Um, you will have the overlap between the interim superintendent, and so we've you know budgeted that for you as well. So, uh -huh. How do we know that's only two weeks? What do you mean? What if it means, what if we want four? Well, then you, you just have to pay yeah. twice as much. <laughs> yeah. Well, then you double it. I just <laughs> went by what I thought was reasonable. I really, uh, yeah, I mean, but. Besides, have, have we agreed a rate with this person? Well. We don't have a person. Well, it's. Well, we so know it's just a plot. Depends on what you get. Yeah, it could yes, be more. Yes, it is. Probably, I, I okay, that's a, yeah. that, that was yeah, my point. It it's an more. estimate. That's my point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've tried to give you everything we know it's about. Tried to capture, yes. <laughs> um, and then the Securitas coverage. This was just additional security. Um, that we added last spring. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. But it's that, and that was uh, at the end of last year. So. So I have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All these items out of payroll. Do they fall into the into the payroll category? I mean, Hunter. You see what I mean? The, the you mean the I the like, the like the search, the search. No, Should no, it doesn't. No, it no the Mr. Ankuma, the, the the concept here is that now that we've hired everybody and you know accounted for all the vacancies, that we know what retirement people are in, what their salaries are, what health insurance they're taking, we could take what what the actual payroll burden is, project that out for the year. Hold it up against what we've budgeted, and we can say, and, you and know, we're, a, we're 391 to the, the good the, right now. Which is good because yeah. you don't know it until you get to this time that you've right. got to get everybody hired, everybody in place, and then running their benefits is a yeah. totally different ballgame. So this year we're actually sitting good. Lot. Usually it's kind of like you're either a wash and sometimes you're in the negative. Yeah. So, um, but these are coming again from meeting with the principal teams and saying, what well, is there anything we could do that could help at some of these buildings? And they're all very tiny things, but they help them where they're really feeling it. So we're presenting this to you that we're trying to look at the financial side. Um, that still left that kind of 12,000, but if you plug that into the superintendent search, you'd be at a zero, yeah. so. And where are we on the contingency? Um, contingency right now, we, we a, we're did about the, 120, the I think. And I think we're sitting at about 120, yeah. but highly, highly likely you're gonna need that for legal fees. Um, you know, we, we've got to come out of um, Hunt and Williams from Mount Daniel and look at where we are, right, and we have a couple of other things that are, are there, as well as you also, we're, we're hoping the boiler and those things make it through the winter, so. Um. As I've been told before, <coughs> hope is not a strategy. I know. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's let not me, much. Let me it's ask there. a question. <laughs> this is great, but not to give you additional work, Hunter. Yeah. But can we have a worst case scenario budget with all the things that we hope are gonna happen outside of this, because for this school that, year or for FY for this school year, because this that informs no. what we do, which to me is Boom. to reach out across the aisle. As in, these numbers need to be, especially the superintendent search, the overlap, mm -hmm. the and all the other expenses that are coming that are due with all this, all that's going on. We're going to need to go I, I, unless there's some money somewhere I'm not aware of, but. As I see things, we're going to have to reach across to our colleagues on the other side and ask for money. The question is, how much? I think the challenge may be if, if for instance, when Tinner Hill opens October 1st, you know, what if we really, because you don't know. We don't know, we don't know. If Broad continues to grow, it's only at 19 students. What if in the next four months it has 30 some odd students and four of those have significant special needs? I mean, you don't, you know, depending on the children, you can have one child who needs an actual teacher just for the one child. So we don't know with Tinner Hill what's going to happen <coughs> there yet either. So I, I guess the problem is you can make it as bad as you want. Yeah. I mean, all yeah. the boilers I, can I, go, yeah. all I'm the saying, HVAC can go at George Mason, the roof can collapse in the auditorium. The, the, the reason um, I, I, I'm saying, I think Dr. Jones and I are in violent agreement. It could be worse, and it probably will get worse. All I'm saying is the budget that was approved, I mean, having chopped off almost a million dollars and spent right. going through June to the, I don't know that it's, it's got any fat left in that. But we've got all these additional expenses staring us in the face with the departures, the, high, the hires, the interim, and all of that. And I'm saying, why don't we prep a budget for that? Because we are going to need extra money we do not have to meet those needs. You see what I mean? Well, I, and I think this document kind of sets out a guess for identified for the for the known unknowns 
Um, it doesn't take into account the unknown unknowns. We've got the contingency at 120K. We have 12,000 extra, so we've got a little overage here that, that is pretty much all now spoken for. Uh, you know, one of the questions is going to be, um, you, I think you can spend as much as you'd like on a superintendent search. You can uh, gold plate it as an exaggeration, but I think one of the questions is what do we think is going to be a sufficiently thorough process um, at, at, at what price point? Um, and, and that's not going to break the bank. I mean, if it's another $15,000. I, I, I think I think maybe I'm going a little faster with the numbers, but I still do not see how you get an extra cent out of the existing budget with an additional, well, how many more kids do we have? 150? Yeah, but you've absorbed them because your class sizes have gone up. So the thing is, you know, instead of having 22, you have 24. You have, I mean, it, you have teachers that are at the max. We have so many teachers at the max of their case Correct. at their caseloads in secondary and then also at elementary. It's everywhere. It, it's gonna you're gonna feel it in FY18, I guess is what I'm saying. Now, if something on the facility side happens, you know, that's big. That's really different. Here's here's where here's where I, we sat here and chopped everything from. Yep. Well, we don't do chalk now, but what were those little things that we were nickel and diming here five, three months ago? By virtue of those, that increase in the number of kids, I see us needing even more of that and all of that getting absorbed. About this budget year or next budget year? Th this budget year. I I'm still not convinced. I, I still think we don't even have enough money in the budget to do what we have to do this year. <coughs> and I'm just saying let's prepare ourselves to be willing to to ask for more money. And you're saying our operating budget this year is already going to probably be insufficient. Oh, already. geez. Yeah. I could see it. I, I, you know, I mean, I'm willing to let it play out. <coughs> but I, I'm telling you, I, I look at these numbers. It's still very go, early <coughs> in the year. I, I, I look at these numbers and I go, if, if all of these are what you're having to account for, plus 120,000, which was, which was always a small contingency, you know, all right, I'll let, you, I'll let us okay. keep right. working. Well, I'll let us keep working. But this gives I us let a us sense of where we are. And, and also, just so get, to give the board a sense, um, just did the math real quickly. In terms of the list of these items, about 203,000 are one-time items that, are, that would be FY16 expenses only and would not carry forward. However, about 175 of these, those, especially those related to enrollment, would, would be recurring. And, and I would note that at the budget and finance meeting, I believe Mr. LaCondra said that receipts were 800000 ahead. And so there is some maneuvering room um, in terms of the, the receipts right now, which could help offset some of the anticipated as well as unanticipated um, expenses. I, that final figure, Mr. Kimball, won't be known until when? Um, this was a notional 800,000. When does it become? <coughs> it should be known in October. It should be known yeah, in October. yeah. Okay. Kind of goes along with this one. So. Yeah. The other week that Hunter just wanted you to have, it goes along with this whole discussion um, as we were trying to figure out the funding for you, is that very first page that just shows you um, that operating, what the beginning balance was. Um, and then just as a reminder, so that we've tried this a zillion different ways yeah. to get people to really understand how to read it, but you have already plugged in that 465 you know, that's that we knew about. And so this is kind of giving you a picture of FY18, what you think you're going to have to plug in for fund balance uh, going forward. Right. And it, and it would be about $100,000 more th th than this year. Um, given Which is the, good, actually. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's very good. Um, also uh, attached is uh, a summary sheet from the annual school report that I completed and uh, have sent down to the sh state, which, which um, shows basically where the money goes by category and and on the far right there's um, the year before last FY15 and then last year FY16 and there's comparative statistics there and you just want to point out that spending on instruction did increase slightly again um, I think this is the third or fourth year in a row that um, that we've been focusing more money into, into the classroom and on instruction 
Okay. Yeah. Um, then with respect to the interim mm. superintendent position, uh, I, I think the next <coughs> step is probably we need to post this and get this out so that we can start getting names. Um, the mechanics of that are how do we how do we do that? We just go ahead and put just it up by put it up by like us. any other position. Really? Okay. Is there anything else we should be doing? Uh, should we should probably we reach out to the list. Specific yeah. people That's can specific. can receive okay. contacts. Okay. There's anything prohibiting you from identifying specific candidates. How quickly do you think it would be before we can put that out? What? The, uh, the posting? The posting. Oh, I can do it tonight. <laughs> well, well. Do I can do it tonight. <laughs> well, I think it'd be probably a good idea to <laughs> <laughs> look it over before it goes out. I mean, it's a job, job description. So okay, yeah, right. right. I meant yeah. just posting it. Yeah. I can do that tonight. But yeah. yeah, your job description. Yeah, you're right. I don't know what you want. Is it not? Is it not all that it is? The current job description. <laughs> I mean, that's... You do have to think about salary, though, and, and that sort of thing. You don't have... Competitive right. here's, salary. Here's, here's my question, and I don't know... <laughs> and I don't know no, 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 here's my there question. or here? Here's my question. I don't know anything about HR. I'm thinking you post it if it's a, like, a, you post a job, but if you, if it's like a contract, a short term, or you could just say, we're going to do this for six months. Or through the end of the yeah, it yeah. can be as simple as that. Okay. But if you want okay. specific characteristics okay. that you want, and it's not something that was the same as when Dr. Jones was hired, then I would need something from the school board. But if it, if you wanted to say the same thing that you were asking for when you hired Dr. Jones, of course we we have that, and we can. And we'd expect it to there. come and do what well, him or her to come do what Dr. Right. Jones is doing. Right. So it has to be the same job description, pretty much. Yeah. I don't know how you tweak that. I'm just concerned about. I'm just concerned about. I'm just concerned about the, the <laughs> length of the the length of the the con, the contract. But I guess you know how to word it. You're you're an HR, but because I'm saying the this, this thing are ends be totally different this from the thing hosting. ends on the contract June 30th, right? After we well, yes, asking for someone to come in to do something until June 30th. So. Do or negotiated in date. Do you post it? Okay. Do you post yeah, it I'm the just going to say, wouldn't we just negotiate? Job? We would yeah, put a regular. We, we got two things here. Yeah, we, we, we put we a got regular. Three things. We got, out there. We've got budget, we've got posting, and we've got duration. So we'll post it. We'll probably say interim. We're guessing through June 30th. Um, and, and then you know, we'll be able to negotiate the contract. And so you know, I think the first thing is to get get the solicitation, get the candidates lined up. Um, one, of the, one of the things where this could start to become a problem budgetarily is if, if we are not asking for construction supervision expertise, then that will be an add-on. That will be a, another function or person or both to assist with that. And, and then, then you start to get into your scenario, is, Mr. Ankuma, where, where there are some additional budgeted items that need to be accommodated. Is there, let me, and while we're at it, let's just open it up. Is there a need for that person, or is there a need to discuss that role? As in... Job description for uh, it? No, or? The, 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 the construction supervision piece. As in, for the next... What are we, not in six months, nine months? Is this something that could be separated and outsourced? That's our but, you're, but we're still then spending the money that we would give to an interim if we were to do that. So it's, we're not saving any money by separating it out to give to someone else at the end of the day. But that would be the one piece. I would think that the job description that we currently have, at least for the remainder of this school year, we would work with that and potentially with an interim. I think we do need to add in some level of construction management to needs to be there because we do have well, one project it, it, ongoing. Yes, yes, and yes, 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 Mike. Hold, hold on one second. So, so threshold question, Arcadis, can mm -hmm. they, is there anything they're not 
doing or able yes. to do. You have to have an educator at the table or you will end up with a building that doesn't really meet the needs <laughs> of children and That's teachers. And you have to. And it doesn't mean you can't, you know. So, so given the time schedule we have, what value would be added knowing that we have the building design and I'm going to put it out here. If we've got Mount Daniel and we know it's going to be, we know what Mount Daniel is going to look like. Do we need construction management on that before June 30th? Uh, isn't the building already designed? Well, that's, that's, well, bear with me. That's one question. And we don't have anything on GM. So, no, we're not talking about GM. We're just talking about getting through Mount Daniel right now. Well, but Mount Daniel's already been designed, and I, I'm assuming the plans are in place. You're resuscitating them. You're not reinventing that wheel. It's already done. It's a timing thing. How much construction management do we need between now and June 30th? They also, though, and just so that, I mean, you could certainly go in that route, but it would be very dangerous to do that because what you're doing is exposing yourself on things like guaranteed maximum price, which right now they're taking stuff out to bid. You know, you, you need somebody on behalf of the school division. And where schools get into trouble is when they don't have construction management on the school side, and then you're really just trusting that a construction company is going to bring those best numbers to you, and that's when you end up way over budget. Absolutely. But what is our cadence's value if they're not doing that? They are doing it, and, and they're doing it. I mean, that's what they will be doing between now and the end of the school year. Everything from helping us, you know, like when they talk to Aaron about staging the trailers and when it works best and making sure the construction team's not showing up at times of the day when they don't want them, and they do all of that. Great. Okay, so what's so the my, question what's is, the my question is, there is, no the, there is interim, no the interim, do they need to know much about construction management or will Arcadis be able to handle it? Oh, will Arcadis be able to do that? Arcadis will be able to handle a lot of it of uh, where they are right now, probably until you get into March and April. But you still have to have an educator at the table and it doesn't, you know, Aaron may come to some of those meetings and, you know, represent the school. You just try not to overload the principal because you really want them out in, in their buildings with children, you know. I, I, think, we're, I think we're in violent okay, agreement. So then, then, then maybe we are okay with the combination of the Mount Daniel principal and the interim superintendent. Yeah, especially can so. we have a, a bigger role for SEVI on the, not so much the exactly. educator side, but the facility side. Yeah, he he actually is fully engaged in Mount Daniel. He'll be oh, really, yeah. Yeah, right. he's, he's in all the meetings. In everything. He just will tell you, he doesn't know classrooms and, okay. you know. Right, he's not supposed to. Besides, yeah. as long as they don't spend any, as long as they don't spend any money without our authorization or the authorization, you know, then they can't do it much damage, can they? It's not like they're off with a checkbook, <laughs> okay? They're going to spend all of your money. Yes. And that's yeah. the guaranteed yes. maximum price issue. The question is, what do they spend it on? And that's where the school people are important. Arcadis doesn't represent the division. They represent all of you as the owner's rep. But they shouldn't be charged with making the decision about what type of carpeting, what type of flooring, what type of windows, where do the windows mm -hmm. go. Um, that is an educational decision, and Arcadis is construction management, not educational management. Where does SEVI fall? Educational? No. 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 Sort of between. It's facilities. SEVI is really facilities, and so when we're, when we're doing things like Saturday morning having to notify the neighbors that the big loud trucks are coming in and that the chain link fence is unlocked, and I mean, he's got a full-time job just on-site management for us with facilities, especially so, on weekends. So, so what would a superintendent need to know or what would the superintendent have to know? Or what would this person need to know that? That makes it the, that piece so special. I, I'm struggling with if, 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 the, if the interim is, is appointed and he or she has to make a decision on carpet, is that a That's special ASAC skill? Committee. <laughs> That's ASAC committee. So really, honestly, I think an interim will be fine getting between now and the end of the school year. And, you know, with the interim, if you ask VSBA, they'll have a contract that'll give you flexibility where the interim just wants 30 days notice because you might have find a superintendent by March or, you know, that can actually start. So if they're an assistant superintendent somewhere, they may be willing to start for you in March. So you know whoever that person is and what that skill set is and there's a lot of permitting and and things like that well, that's actually on here for the mount daniel update where we'll be is much better than where we thought we may be even three days ago after our meeting today so i think it'll be fine and, and like you mentioned, you, 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 just you, mentioned you just mentioned asac you just mentioned asac 
wouldn't they be helpful in this process? Well, they are. And, and they actually, yeah. once they have to make like color decisions and what kind of carpet, but you have to have somebody there to say to the construction team before you ever put the carpet out in front of the teachers, if you're going to go get, you know, $40 a square foot, $15 a square foot, and $5 a square foot, they're not going to pick the $5 a square foot carpet. So <laughs> you have to have somebody there that's going to say, and Sevi helps with that as well, that is not the quality we want in our school because it's going to be worn out in two years. That one is not the quality we want in our school because we just can't afford it. And we can't, you know, put everything in carpet and not have anything left over for high impact drywall. That's the kind of discussions that you're having. And I mean, it'll be an experienced superintendent if they're an interim, so you should be fine. And then yeah. ASEC helps once you narrow the three choices of carpet that you can afford all three with three different patterns. ASEC comes in and says, oh, we all really like this one. Yeah, I think that's where you put in, you know, construction management experience preferred and you make that part of the discussions and it comes down to you got three people who are kind of equal and two of them haven't ever done that that might be the deciding factor but you don't make it you know a requirement that you've done you know a, a school from start to finish worth between yeah. 20 okay. and I think you've answered my I think you've answered you just answered okay. my question okay yeah although one thing that just popped into my head in this discussion and I don't know why I didn't think of it earlier is part of the job description is one thing we want to say if you are the interim you are not allowed to apply for the permanent and I realize they're, they're probably different animals if somebody's willing to be interim you know maybe they're not looking for something permanent but is that something we should even think about I would I wouldn't worry about it yeah okay well no I mean because they're Jim, good Jim enough Snyder, to stay Jim let them Snyder stay came out of retirement <laughs> and you know he's been here now five years so that was okay, a bit of an anomaly but it just hit me that if we had somebody who came here and oh. liked being here and suddenly they're the incumbent yeah but we always have the option of not hiring them yeah, but so you, yeah. I mean, yeah they, they, they might they be a good apply. candidate I mean you I, might I want an interim to, for another year because you don't yeah. find the right candidate I mean that happens See? too yeah. yeah I just don't yeah. like I think, closing I think we'll, that door yeah we'll we'll point. I don't think it's we'll necessary. have a lot of flexibility okay. there so okay anything else on that all right, let us move into the... Can I just make sure, just for clarification, someone's going to send me what you want to post when you want to post it? Is that correct? Well, if, if you... You need to send the... I think PD you're sending it out. Yeah. Well, I actually did send it out last week, or Marty sent it out to the whole school board, the superintendent search and the criteria we used before, so... Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll get that okay. where we need it to be, and then we'll, we'll okay. circle it. We'll send it back to you and we can post it then we'll anywhere else other video. than the website and maybe vast that you want it posted let me yeah let me let me ask around a little okay. bit we'll start there all right thank you okay any comments by lisa did you say you sent this early you sent this you sent it to us earlier? marty marty, oh, marty Cadell yeah. sent it out on last, september 15th yeah, last okay month, so last so everybody take a look at that and get comments by uh thursday close the business yeah Send it to me and send and copy John too, and we'll we'll, we'll get it biffed up, and then we'll we'll circulate it for everybody to look at, and then we can Did Marty send, send it, as send as it as out. Okay. I don't know. Did Marty send it as an attachment? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Some attachments. Yeah. It's five actually. It's like a bunch of attachments. Five attachments. It's like six. Five or six. Six attachments. attachments. Okay. okay. It's the whole process. <laughs> All right now the final thing is the award. The, oh, yeah, we, okay. The the next to final thing, uh, awards and support for profit companies. Um, we we have said that we want to <coughs> have a discussion about this. Uh, you know what our thoughts are about the issue. What if anything would and should be done in policy um, there has been one proposal that has been circulated um, Mr. Ankuma no 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 sorry okay. no it's been me I'm sorry that you so, that so I, w I would just throw it open for for discussion I mean obviously there are many flavors of <coughs> that, that exist in the community um, we've got EIE, we've got, um, we've got awards where, to the best of my knowledge, the, you know, for example, the Renaissance and the Apple Distinguished Schools are fairly uh, you know, benign from what we've heard. Um, the question is what, 
our thoughts are about these as a general matter and what do we uh, want to do, if anything, about this. What has been our history? <coughs> what has been our history prior to the last two that seem to have garnered all the attention? Like specifically, Renaissance and Apple. Prior to that, have we done any such? Like U.S. News is a for-profit company. It sits on our website every year, and it has for ages. US well, News. there was also, I mean, the U.S. News ranking. Yeah, I mean, the magazine. The US <coughs> it's News. used to do Newsweek as well, but the, the ranking. Mm -hmm. And then for, I mean, it, which it, you get a gold it, medallion. It, or something. Yeah, it sort of runs a gamut from from that to for a while, and I don't know how long ago it, it may still be, but it was there was some sponsorship of the field, right? There was. Correct. Yeah, there was a, lease, a named leasing agreement for the naming of the stadium field. So, um, which lapsed, or what? What happened with that? Correct. Okay. So, I mean, there's a there's a wide array of activity um, involving for-profit companies, and the question is, um, what, if anything, we we want to do? So there there was a car dealership that had a sign up, I think on the scoreboard, wasn't it? It was, it was everywhere. There were six, <laughs> six, <laughs> six, six, six locations. On our one. They just renewed their theirs two years ago. Does Volvo make school buses? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll start. The, the, I, I think with all the other ones, it's been clear. We, we, do we have a presentation last year about some company that wants to put up a cell phone tower behind the, yes. you know, there's some consideration, and, and you legal guys can tell me what, what that, what that, you know, what the implications of that. Are. But at least <coughs> in those situations, there's there's some sort of consideration for 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 for, for what they they're getting some advertising and so they pay for it. Okay, the school, I guess, we benefit for, from that. The issue with these two, that I guess I, I still am I'm a little uncomfortable with, is the the. the designation, certification, whatever we call it, is, is, is because we bought something. No, it is not. Or at least that's my understanding. Or that's, that's, the, that's how, that's what's raising the concern that would we get this if we did not buy anything? Would we get these certifications if we did not buy the software or buy the laptops? That's the question. You know, if we get a new U.S. News and World ranking, they rank just about everything under the sun. Not unless you take AP tests. So if you're a total dual enrollment school, you're not going to get ranked on there because you're not an AP school. I mean, I, I, well, I, I, well, no, here's, here's an even simpler question. And that, the question is, is there any arrangement that brings into question the integrity of the educational process. There are, for example, with the U.S. News, at least in the law school world, there are law schools that move heaven and earth to take the five criteria that go into the U.S. News rankings so as to rise in those rankings. So... Just law schools. And, and, <laughs> Which is why I say they the rank everything and under the sun. in the college world. <coughs> right. So... There are a couple of things. There, there's the decision-making process and the integrity of it. There's a whole other issue as to whether or not any money or consideration has changed hands because U.S. News doesn't charge you to rank. Um, it may influence how you rank because you want to do certain things that, that move the needle, be it you know, financial aid, be it books in the library, um, you know, be it test scores for, for students, be it yield on admission. And so I think the, the question is fundamentally ensuring the integrity of the educational process. And are there any situations that we have seen where that integrity has been called into question? Well, not just called Legitimately, into question, where, where we mm -hmm. think it's mm -hmm. in question. Mm -hmm. Because you can always or, call Yeah, or there's a reasonable it's chance it could be. It's because right. of the innovative we, mm -hmm. we use. So. Can I say that? Yeah. And are our policies adequate to ensure that the integrity of the educational process is maintained? That's what it comes down to. And there are many ways, some involving consideration and some not, 
where that can happen. And I, and I think it's important to understand that as with U.S. News, which is a, a good example of no money changing hands but still distortion, that we want to guard against, potentially. Justin, can I say something? And I would say that we're not recognized because we either have the Renaissance license or we have Apple products. We're recognized because of how we're using it innovatively or for our instructional gain for our students, how we're using it in our RTI process or things like that. So the recognition comes because of the way that we utilize the tool to make education better for our students. There are many districts who probably have, have Apple and have Renaissance, but if they're not using it in an innovative way, then they don't receive those, th that kind of recognition. Uh, is, is this, are these recognition certifications on a, on a, on a, how should I put it? Are, are they, is there a limit to how much, when we'll get this? Or, for instance, we've had it, what, a year, two years? It's Which one? Two years. Two years. For two years for Apple. Is it ad infinitum, or is it going to terminate it will, after, a, after a point? It will terminate unless we um, do the, apply, get invited to apply, first of all, and then that our actual book, iBook, meets the, all of their criteria. So let me ask a question. If we continue to do what we were doing or use these computers the way we're using them or use the renaissance the way they're using them but refuse to apply, will, the, will we still get the designation? If we don't apply, we wouldn't we get the designation. The educator team couldn't even evaluate what you're doing. But it wouldn't change the credibility of our, or the quality of our school system, would it? The quality of the school system, no. I think, you know, I think. I, I, I guess yeah. the point, I'm, the question I'm asking is, if we don't have the certification, does it change Mason? Would it change? If we do if, have it, does it change Mason? If, if, if we don't have it, <laughs> will, which, will it change the U.S. World News rankings? Would, you, you know. Yeah, but I mean, making this about one, <coughs> first of all, Aaron, you've been patiently waiting. So. It's not one. I mean, it's those two. <laughs> right, but still, making it about two discrete things misses the broader point that, you know, uh, who, was the, who was the one at, um, at MEH a couple of years ago? Brad? Brad? Who's Plans. Mm -hmm. Plans. Who got, he, he became, what Apple was Distinguished it? Educator. An Apple Distinguished Educator. He's a Google Educator he, as well. So he is Rob Carey. Well, we have, we have Google. You know, he wouldn't be able to talk about that. I mean, Apple I understand the intent well. of what we're talking yeah. about. Apple Academy. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm too. trying to figure out how it actually like works good. because you know, you, you are taking away some opportunities from people. If you get the Agnes Meyer Award, can you not put that, you know, on your signature block because that's a for-profit company? The Washington Post. Uh, yeah. I guess what I'm asking is if we don't have I'll it, people to read their paper. Right. <laughs> make Mason less of a, of a school system. Or does it make Falls Church City Public Schools less of a school system? But if you're taking away the opportunity system. to get things like that from teachers, I yeah. think that's a negative. It, it is, and I, I think teachers sort need of, to be recognized. So the value, your, your value, your, you're saying that the value is in what it does for our staff. In part, yeah. It is, it is valuable for the staff. And honestly, I mean, five out of our seven board members right now were on the board when we were asked to apply. We didn't even think that we would get past the application. Mm -hmm. Then we let the board know when we were kind of in that final round and they were evaluating whether or not we would even meet this, meet this level. Our board was excited about this. So this is not something that we've just pushed with from the staff, the board was excited. And when we won this last October, the board all stood there with us and an awful lot of our staff. And it does mean a lot to the staff when you've had, you know, several years of incredibly challenging work, work to be yeah. where the staff are right now. And okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so. And then, and then Ms. Ward. I think part of this is that people are, are uncomfortable because it's, a, it's an award from a for-profit company. So it feels like it has less merit than an award that you, that you, if you've got to apply for the award because you bought the product and then you can apply for an award for how you use the product, it feels like it has less merit than an award that you are spontaneously given. So someone is evaluating you from the outside, let's say the VDOE or the VSBA and saying, you know, we've been looking at what you're doing and you are really an exemplary school district and we want to give you an award for that. And that's different than applying for an award and saying, well, I bought this product, I want to apply for an award to show how well I use it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, so with applying for the award, but I think that that's where some of the discomfort comes in. And I, I think even it's for less the about the award itself mm -hmm. than it is about how that award is then advertised and that's put out to the community. 
So it's there's nothing, and I think Phil says this in his in his um, his draft, and what I added to it was that I don't think we should be prevented from displaying an award in the superintendent's office or central office or in the teacher's room. But I think the constant use of it, maybe in a signature block or a banner, is what is making people question mm -hmm. how we're That's advertising right. the words instead of maybe other metrics of success for our schools, like 100% graduation rate. That is an incredible metric of success <laughs> that I would rather. So if I think Apple if people were to would recognize to that, would we want to? Not? If they're like, you're an exemplary school because you have 100% graduation. You know, if they're coming, if they're coming to us and saying we've, <coughs> we've looked at a bunch of school districts and we've kind of pulled you out as this really amazing school district. You didn't apply. You didn't come to us and say, look how amazing we are. We <laughs> saw you're amazing. You know, we've been working with you and we're going to give you this award. I think that's and probably and I. It would still flounder this bit that Phil put in that we still wouldn't advertise that everyone put in the signature line and put it on the, you know, put it outside the school because it that kind of elevates the Apple Award above other things that our teachers and our administration are doing that are really, really incredible. Okay. I think that's what's cool. cool is they're allowed to put on their signature lines what, yeah. they're, what they're really proud about as an educator, and it's probably what they put on their resumes as well. I mean, because mm -hmm. so it's not a requirement that it goes right. on right. the Ward, education. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, yeah, no, I, so I just was trying to, you know, when people say I don't understand, like, people don't care as much about the funding the scoreboard or the field or whatever. Like, that's difference. that's helping us pay for something that yeah. we need to pay for. This is, I think this is, and you're not putting on your signature block and everything else. I think that's kind of different, and people are really used to, like, Listen, that's how we have to pay for a lot of things, is get some local advertising to help us. Um, anyway. Yeah, and, and uh, I totally see your point, um, Aaron. Uh, <coughs> like about, you know, you could look at this as crass, 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 sorry, the braces are bothering me today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lisping. Crass commercialism, or you could look at it as a program that these vendors or these companies um, have for their customers. I, I, it's like the, the what is the dog wagging the tail or the tail wagging the dog? It's, we get the product because we want it. We think it's a good fit for our schools and the vendor happens to give out awards. And I know as, a, as an educator myself, I, I'm very proud of any award I get. <laughs> And, and and really truthfully it's not I don't I don't see this as being a part of, of um, some kind of nefarious way to get free advertising I just feel it's a part of recognizing um, schools and teachers who use the, their product in, in a progressive way I, I mean that's just me that's how I, I look at it like I, I, but I do see the, I do see the other side to this, but I don't think that weighs as heavily as you know looking at this program for what it is. I don't think Apple really needs to <laughs> advertising. I, I, I don't think this company does, and I don't think that's really what they're getting from our <coughs> school district. I think it'd be naive to I mean no offense gets smart, but this is oh. clearly a marketing PR thing for them too. I mean this is you get a great school district like Falls Church City, and you can say look at the school district and we, they get mm -hmm. they get to send people in to look at our schools it's great advertising and marketing for them give our school districts are trying to decide what do i do, what do i do like do i get an apple do i get a dell do i do nothing and they come see what we're doing and of course you'd be like wow what they're doing is amazing we should get an apple you know so, i mean it is mm -hmm. it is free marketing sure. for them you know I, it is also an award that our we should be proud of for having achieved but it is also marketing and advertising for them you know, they don't give well, these awards just because they, they really like want to us. recognize but, your innovation. Like, there's, there's, a, there's a quid pro quo. It's a for-profit for company. Like, there's a reason they're doing it. But but I would, I, I trust the judgment of the building administration. <coughs> I trust the judgment of the professionals. If they want to put something in their signature block that reflects an award of which they have pride, I, I don't have a problem with it. If they're if if somebody's getting uh, a two-week Bahamas vacation <laughs> because they're looking at devices to buy, that's a problem. But I, I think, you know, I, I was talking with a friend who who works in education technology over the weekend, and you know this, the the Apple device is really just a shell. It runs Google Apps. We do Google Apps training <laughs> programs here. Um, there is a there is a host of apps. I don't think we really understand or appreciate how many apps tailored for individual student needs are, are running on that shell. Um, 
I'm confident that a Dell or a Surface or almost anything else could serve the same purpose. And so, you know, I, I think people in the buildings and in the classrooms should be able to, to tout whatever thing they do, and I don't think it's incumbent on us. Um, subject to our mission of ensuring integrity in the educational process and the procurement process to second guess their selection. So, you know, it, unless there's some problem, maybe, maybe people have a visceral reaction because they, they think the money changers are in the temple, but I haven't seen <coughs> that happen in any real way. And I think we do sig significantly undervalue the amount of pride people take in their achievements in there is like, technology integration, which isn't easy and which I do think we're doing a pretty good job at if you read about all our neighboring school districts catching up to some of the things that we're doing. But I don't think we as a board have any understanding or appreciation of just how many things are being used on whatever device we happen to have. And I'm happy to throw Apple out on its ear if we get a better price from Microsoft for their Surface. And I, I, you know, I don't I just, the thing that's vexing to me about this is I just don't see that this is a huge issue. It's um, and if people want to put it on their signature block, fine, knock yourself out. If you don't, don't have a problem with that either. Um, Listen, I think it's a perception that it, it, it's, that there's, that this is not free. But it is, it is not free. I mean, that's, this is, the, the problem is, if there is a quid pro quo, show me what the quid pro quo is. The quid pro quo is what Aaron just outlined, that they're out there bringing other educators here to sell their stuff. I think they're bringing educators here to seeing what we're doing. I mean, I don't so, think we're but being... But, but, but so they can sell more of their stuff. They, they, either, it, and and yeah. this, this, may be, this may be the conspiracy theory, but they're using us for marketing. Now, they came in and said, listen, for all the good work you've done, you've done we're dumping another 300 laptops for, to you guys for free. I'd look at this differently. But as things stand, I, I, I see them. I would be them, uncomfortable with that. Well, well, yeah, I, I, I would too. But, but, yeah. but I'm, saying, I'm saying that would show that, that would really show how, what, how well they thought of our system, in a sense. And maybe in the commercial world that would happen, and it doesn't happen in the, in the public system. But as I sit here now, that's how I see it. Maybe I'm looking at it from the commercial world again that they send somebody in here to take up some of your time, walk around, say nice things about them, so they can go to the next school district and say, look what we did in Falls Church. Now can we sell you 300 of these things? You know, because where else are they going to demonstrate yeah. the ability they use? So is, I'm is just it saying, that Apple saying, did it I'm, I'm in just Falls Church? It's the perception. <laughs> right. You, you know what I mean? Right, right. It, it, it's the perception. It's not... Well, let's... Well, okay. we, 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 Mr. We're, Mr. we're probably both, both right, but it, there's a perception that we're not, there's, this, this is not free. Okay, Mr. Webb, even though we haven't seen any evidence that it's not, not. Generally, I, I agree. I think the biggest thing that this is, has fetched up, the biggest push from back from the community is the advertising part of it, of the signature line. I think if more than likely, and I could be completely wrong, if that part of it was not done, I don't necessarily know if we would have we would be sitting here having this level of conversation about this but it's because of the banners and it's because of the signature blocks coming from a for-profit company i think that started a big well why are we doing this for this particular company because it really to me i think at the end of the day any product that we have and they see us doing it, i think any company is going to ask because I'm quite sure we've gone to schools to look at products because we do want to see what the products that before we spend $300,000 on whatever product that we're getting, we want to see how a school district is potentially implementing and using that. So I think we would get that question to ask to come in, well, can we have school district X come to see, take a look at what your product, look at the product and see how you've implemented it and used it in your school district, we're going to get asked that, I think, anyways, whether this award came or not, and mm -hmm. them coming in to ask those questions. But I think it's purely because of the advertising piece that they, that I think parents and the community has seen uh, banners on the school, signature blocks that have raised it to the level of having these conversations, because I think really we would have been 
some of the visits and things like that would have more likely, it, we may not have done them, but we would have, I would think, totally have been asked, can school district X come see the innovations that you've maybe doing with this? Because I'm sure they're gonna pay attention to what we're, how we've implemented and used the products in our schools. And if they see us using it in an innovative way, they're gonna ask to be able to bring, because they are, and they, they are for profit and they are gonna want to sell to other school districts. And they're gonna use some of their current clients to try to help with in that if that client who they have is using it in a innovative way. So that's gonna happen anyways, but I think if we had just potentially maybe not have done the level of advertising that we are putting out of the banners and things like that, I don't know if we would have had as big of a concern from the community as we have of, well, what exactly are we getting for this or what are they getting? Mm -hmm. So so are we, are we being criticized for selling ourselves too cheap? Is that the problem? I, mean, I, I honestly, the, the fact, again, if there, if there were a reality behind the perception, then there would be cause for concern. But I, I, if, if school districts are coming to visit because we're doing something that's worthy of emulation, I think that's A, a cause for pride, and B, one of the things you do as a professional is you help educate other professionals about what you're doing. But I still don't see what, what, what is the loss of integrity? What is the problem? What is the reality behind the perception? I mean, I, I, if, if we're taking money and we don't have a problem about taking money from a car dealership or something for our stadium, how can we, how, how can we be not beating ourselves up for not taking money? But that, that, that's like out in the open. That's like clearly what that is. That is clearly advertising. We are selling advertising there, 100%. That is, you're, give us some money or we're gonna put your banner up. Okay. Cool, we're done there. Okay, but then the Apple thing is, we're gonna buy your product and because we want to, because we want to use it. And in return, oh, we can apply for an award that you've set up, Apple, that we can apply to. We get that award, and now the, our reward is we get to say we got the award, and you get to bring in people to our school to see what we're doing. So the reward is that we get to advertise and market for them. So we're selling ourselves and too And we cheap don't have to do problem. that I think, part. Selling, like, I think anyway, and we don't have to. We don't I, have to. I think, the, I think yeah. what you have to understand is that when they reach out to us <coughs> and they want to bring a whole team of people from Pennsylvania or wherever it is, there's a huge sense of pride where teachers want to showcase what they're doing, the principals are excited, and, you know, and next time somebody wants to come, maybe the school board needs to come for a visit because you really don't talk about Apple at, at all. They come to say, well, what's going on in the classroom? And see three kids sitting out in the hall who are you know collaborating on a google doc we don't even use so really several of the items that are actually on the mac because we're also a google apps district um and, and it's fascinating they they go and they spend time in our makerspace our makerspace really doesn't have anything to do with this they listen to a panel of our kids usually talk that just generally we're talking to other educators about how te technology has transformed their own learning and they're just they literally just talk to our people and it's that's still i mean that still is marketing and advertising for i mean I, you know, I've, I've worked in a for-profit company who sold things. Like this is, this is just, they're selling a product, you know, well, and they are, you know, I'm sure, I, I have base, but it is, it is <coughs> at the end of the day, like, you know, I worked on a product and I thought I was doing it to help people and they said, what's the number one rule here? What's everyone's goal? And it's like, to sell the product was everyone's goal, no matter what you did. Well, and Even I think I that probably is their goal, the, the but product. I think you have to understand education. We rely on one another, <laughs> and I am so thankful for the schools that opened their doors for us to take staff, whether they were Apple or, or Google Apps District, so that we could go learn from them, and that is the way that we see what's happening and what's innovative. And I feel like, I mean, we're happy to have that responsibility to be help other school divisions grow. And, and we're still, I I mean, even when we look at some of the programs that we've bought, they talked about the school in Fairfax County with it's getting great ESOL. They're going to open their doors. I can guarantee you they're going to have a program that's working or something that they're doing that we're going to learn from. We just took Ricky from them. I mean, that's, so that's really what it's all about. And there's a lot of pride that goes with it. And it's not about advertising. Again, I think it goes back. The community doesn't like to see the advertisement everywhere, the signature blocks. Yeah. And that there um, are, 
there are but there are other things that we should be proud of and really touting. And we are. And but we don't tout it as much. That's not in our signature blog. Hundred percent graduation rate isn't our signature blog. You know, uh, well, whatever well, but best school in Virginia is in, in our signature blog. You know, Apple distinguished schools in our signature blog, and Apple distinguished school is on our. And I think what it comes down to, and what Phil tried to put in his his suggestion, is that you know it's okay to it's okay to apply for those awards. It's okay to get those awards. It's not okay to put those awards out there, like blanket everything with those awards, over other things that we're doing that are also that are maybe arguably more impressive and aren't coming from a for-profit company. That at the end of the day, even if it is a great resource for schools. At the end of the day, they really, it's a marketing and advertising thing. It's just what it is. So there may be other benefits to it, to our teachers and to our schools, but that's what it is at the end of the day. And that, I think that really makes people feel uncomfortable. And that's my sense from the community, is that this has come up many, many times. And I think to ignore that, I mean, it's great that we're having the discussion and not ignore it, but you know, to say, eh, it's not real, is, is to brush aside a huge segment of our community who is saying, I don't, just doesn't the Optics blanketing of Apple everywhere? It just doesn't make people feel comfortable. It, well, right. I'm just gonna say. I mean, I just pulled up one of our teachers just to see who I know has a lot on their signature block. The person has Google for Education trainer. They have Apple Foundations trainer, and they have the Distinguished Program. So, if we say you can't have Apple or Renaissance, are we going to start watching teachers? signature block and saying you can't do Google for Education Trainer but because Apple's that's something that they, they put on there. Every single teacher signature but, block. But it is, can't be about I mean, Apple. That's it's just not it. on every teacher. If, if it's not on every, no. every teacher I've ever done Anybody can put on. any of that on their signature block yeah. that they want. And no, it's not everybody. Very few people actually have it on there. Yeah, I mean, I just pull mm -hmm. up Ray yeah. who does, you know, tech at, at MEH and he's got, <laughs> he's got this much on his signature block. Right. None of it is Apple. But he's got first Lego League. I mean, first Lego League has been touted and praised, and everybody loves it. But that's to me more ubiquitous than Apple. So but nobody's nobody's saying that's a problem, and that's about as good as advertising gets. And we're really proud of the robotics team. And the, I mean, I understand the idea, but I don't understand how you make it a reality when, in theory, the teachers should be able to dis make these kinds of decisions their own. If the front office at TJ is really proud of being a Google Docs whatever or an Apple whatever and they want to put something up at their school, they should be allowed to. They shouldn't be told they have to. To me, that's the only real line that we should be drawing. It shouldn't be, we're an Apple school, everybody has to have that on their signature block. And I, is anybody required to say anything anywhere in the signature blocks? Are the no, other than the confidentiality of the statement at the building, moment. Are the yeah. building principles required to put up no. banners? I mean, no. I, I think we have to trust in, in the judgment of our personnel. And if there's stuff they're proud of, so be it. But, you know, I, I would say two things. First of all, I don't know how broad or deep the sentiment is in our community. I would think if you did a survey, you might find some interesting results. And, and I think the, the second thing is that um, we have not heard from the staff about what their thoughts are on this. They're the ones who are engaging in this daily. They're the ones who take pride in what they do. And I think we owe it to them before we, de before we decide to tell them what they can and cannot do, what their thoughts are on this. Um, it's a quarter of ten. I think we could probably talk about this till the cows come home, but uh, I would humbly suggest that a we <coughs> consider polling the community as a whole whether there are strong views on this, um, and b uh, engage uh, some representatives from the digital learning teams to find out what their thoughts are on this, and, and that will allow us also to verify whether or not I don't think there is. Um, any pressure to put anything in anybody's signature block anywhere? Was Mr. Reitinger's uh, memo was that to be inserted in the in the policy, or were we to vote on it, or what? That was just a that was just something he was circulating. This is a work session, so there's no action item. Okay. So, does that? So so we can bring that up as. 
So, so what happens with that document? Well, the person who writes policy for us, which would be your attorney, would generally write the policy. Right. Uh, right now, it's in two weeks. Someone else there and he's saying, <laughs> "Here's something. Take a look at it." That's as far as it's gone. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. So essentially, as a group, we can take a look at it and then, at at another time, decide whether we want to incorporate that in the policy document or not. Perfect. Is that? If that if, if if we get if the if the, the board as a body decides to do that, okay. If all right, I guess. Mr. Horn, as a parting word, um, if you include a version of the proposed 5.33 that Mr. Regner sent, it should be conflict checked with your business policy section section four. Um, it would be my early impression that there are conflicts between the definitions of commercial advertising and what's not allowed and what is allowed in other sections. And I don't think it's sufficient to say we don't allow commercial advertising except where we do allow it. I think the board would want to <laughs> tighten that up. <laughs> we would want to tighten that up between the two sections. Well, it shouldn't go in community anyway to me. It should go in business, if anything. Okay, well, we, we, can, we can sort that out. Um, all right, Mount Daniel update. Um, we did reconvene the whole team uh, together today, and uh, I sent a message out to Mount Daniel staff. I also went to the PTA meeting that was held at the elementary tonight just to make sure we're getting the word out. But where we are right now, there's a lot of uh, permitting and planning that has to take place, and they feel like because some of those processes uh, to get through Fairfax County do take a couple of months, um, that where we will be is by April we're hoping to be bringing trailers in so around spring breakish um, but what we won't be doing is demoing during the middle of the year just based off where we are in the process right now and the work we need to do um, the biggest impact well the good thing is it won't impact children or teachers as far as construction and moving children or any of that um, it will mean at the end of the year packing up the classrooms again uh, kind of the day school gets out the original plan kicks right back in place um, and then bringing the trailers in in April will impact parking so we will have to start shuttling staff which if you go back and look at what we planned two years ago because of this timing it actually was much easier when we all reconvened to think about timing um, because we had the, no the November referendum started the next day well now it's already been basically October. So we're just one month ahead of our old schedule. So we were able to take that timeline back out, look at where we were, refresh everybody's memory on the process. So it'll be easy on staff this year, which they were thrilled about today because we thought it may not be. So. And the trailers affect parking because the parking lot becomes Right. Trailer, the parking, parking lot, lot becomes trailers. We've got lots of moving and shuffling of trailers. Um, but we will not be moving children into the trailers, but they've got to get the and trailers in place so that the day school gets out in June, you're moving everything from inside to outside so you can quickly demo the building. So that's where we are. And so uh, what's the completion date anticipated? It, be? Between, we, they believe, and again, there's a lot of work to be done, so between August and December of 18. So it works out where we have summer construction, you have the full school year construction, and then have another summer. But, you know, winter, bad winters, snowzillas, things like that can always, you know, impact um, construction. So August to December, we think that's where the timeline will fall. And if they use the same timeline and thinking, they'll probably have a guarantee opening of October, which is what they had before, but do everything possible to get us in, you know, in August um, so that you can start school. And that's the way it was written previously for the timeline. So that's it. We're in a good place, though. So when the trailers come in and you set, they set them up, that's where they'll be for the next couple of years, or well, for the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. All through next school year. Through That'll next be, and year. they'll become the first grade classrooms. And then there's a trailer on the back side. There's two, I think, actually, that are daycare. One of them's used kind of for a gym area, so that you still have an indoor play space in the middle of winter when it's rainy and that kind of thing. Fun. Big and the, the the GMP for the guaranteed maximum price, all of those numbers are are being ran in <coughs> early December. We should have have those numbers as well. Any okay. questions? No, I heard a lot of positive things from parents about about the about waiting till after the school year. People were really nervous about. I mean, me too. I've got a kid there. You know, construction dust and everything yeah. happening. So I think that's great news. Thank you. And the construction team from Grunley and Samaha, architects the same, the 
you know, head guys at Grunley are the same, but our on-site team has changed, obviously. And so they're kind of reallocating people to us that will actually be on-site with us. So we'll find out in the next few weeks who those people will be. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. We're adjourned. Have a good evening. <laughs>